Good afternoon. Welcome to the 12 p.m. session of the September 14th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comments, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Helen Tard? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Boulder? Is currently absent, um, Vice Mayor Brunner. Good afternoon, I'm present. And Mayor Myers. I'm present, thank you. Okay, first off on our agenda today are a few presentations, uh, with the first being um, a 30 year service pin um, recognition for Jack Sprow. And I will go ahead and turn this over to Isis Ray and Rachel Kaufman from our Parks and Recreation Department. And I'm not sure who's gonna start first, but uh, welcome you guys. Thanks for being here. Myers, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and City Council members, Rachel Kaufman, Recreation Superintendent, and I'll get us started. And I'm honored to join you today to recognize an unbelievably dedicated employee who is celebrating 30 years of distinguished service to the city of Santa Cruz, Jack Sproul. And Jack is on the call there, good, his, his camera's on, but um, I also did wanna share my screen with some uh, photos of Jack. So Jack was originally hired as a temporary city employee back in 1988 at the Civic Auditorium as a maintenance aide and was then hired into a regular position as facility attendant at the London Nelson Community Center. And the majority of his 30 year career at the center has been in his current position as auditorium coordinator. Uh, in his current role, Jack has helped countless youth in our community achieve their dreams of performing on stage. He's worked with numerous youth theater companies throughout the county and beyond to put on performances at the auditorium, including talented performers like Santa Cruz's own James Durbin, whose career began at the center and working with Jack. Uh, over his time at the center, we estimate that Jack has overseen over a thousand theatrical performances at the London Nelson Auditorium. But Jack's talents go far beyond the world of theater. He is also known and appreciated for his patient and calm demeanor, his mind in an emergency. Uh, more than a few times, he has calmly evacuated a full theater house during a power outage at the center. He's trained many community center staff on emergency response and evacuation drills as one of the few city staff who worked on the EOC for both the 89 earthquake and the most recent CZU fires. He also recently a beach host program, which helped educate the public on the beach closures uh, during the COVID pandemic, which uh, is a no fun job, I'll tell you, with people that are coming to the beach and not happy to be turned away. Uh, in addition to his experience on the EOC and various emergency logistics teams, he has been a volunteer with the United States Coast Guard for, 30, for 13 plus years. So basically, if and when the zombie apocalypse, uh, Jack, who you want on your team. 
And I've had the personal pleasure of working alongside Jack um, in my eight years when I worked as the London Nelson Community Center Supervisor from 2008 to 2016. And I can just say he's an incredibly supportive work colleague. Um, and another person who's benefited support is the current London Nelson Community Center Supervisor, Isis Ray, who would also like to say a few words about Jack. So I'll pass on to Isis. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Council and Mayor Myers for letting me also uh, sing additional praises of Jack. Um, so uh, upon the first encounter with uh, the man whose daily outfit consists of head to toe black and who oftentimes wears a low focus concentration on his face, one will find themselves pleasantly surprised to learn that Jack Sproul is truly one of the kindest and most generous gentlemen anyone could be so lucky to meet. He provides customer service that goes above and beyond expectations, and as a result, has built numerous long-lasting relationships with patrons of the London Nelson Community Center, who become repeat customers, collaborators at the center. His how can I help you approach, combined with his knowledge and skill in lighting and sound design, has made him an invaluable member of various theater and production teams that he's worked with at the center. In addition to his interpersonal and tactical skills that Rachel mentioned, Jack is, also has a very strong artistic eye. And during his 30-year career with the city, some of his creative roles have included an event photographer for the Civic in the 90s, a member of the Cultural Council of Santa Cruz County, the curator of the Hallway Art Gallery at LNCC, and also an artist of a well-known painting that has been displayed at the Maw, which is referencing the likeness of London Nelson. It's also been in uh, various articles used over the years. You may have seen it before. And most recently as the director and film editor for the Halloween Horrors Film Competitional promotional videos. Jack carries himself with a quiet confidence that is never boastful or arrogant. He knows who he is and how to handle himself in all situations. And it is this self-assurance with the absence of ego that adds to his approachability and gives others a sense of security and acceptance in his presence. Perhaps most admirable of his qualities is his humility. In a society that often encourages and rewards self-promotion, Jack readily operates outside the spotlight. He's shown unwavering dedication to the city of Santa Cruz, the Parks and Recreation Department, the London Nelson Community Center, its staff and patrons, and his friends and family without the expectation of reward or celebration. The examples of Jack's selflessness and generosity are countless. But some notable incidents include uh, the time he contacted HR to see if he could donate some of his vacation hours to help provide additional time off to a pregnant coworker, quietly adding another coworker to his auto insurance policy. And when her car was in the shop for a week, so he could loan her car, his car to her. And um, volunteering to shop for groceries when another coworker was home ill and couldn't do so. And five he has arrived with favorite treats in hand to share with staff. So as you can tell, this is a very special individual that we're very lucky to work with. So please join me in thanking and celebrating Jack Sproul for his 30 years of outstanding commitment, service, and support that he has provided to the city of Santa Cruz. Congratulations, Jack, and uh, we celebrate you. Jack, I don't know if you have anything to say today, but um, congratulations on this achievement. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if you feel like saying a few words. And if not, we will definitely um, just celebrate your uh, 30 years. Well, to uh, continue my humility, I, I don't really have that much to say really, but uh, to thank you very much, City of Santa Cruz and the council members. It's been an honor to work with the city and for you and for the public for the last 30 years. Thank you, Jack. There's too, too many more. <laughs> and thanks for all you do. Next up, we have item number six, which is a mayoral proclamation declaring September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Um, 
And I believe, um, I don't know if we have Brittany Maldonado Gosline here as the deputy director for Jacob's Heart or if Daniela is the representative today. Okay, Daniela, I was thinking of that when I saw you pop up. So thank you for being here today. Um, this is such an important, um, I feel proclamation just because knowing families who have been affected by losing their children to cancer um, and the fact that, you know, we have one of the nation's most important nonprofits that recognize um, the need for families to um, really, you know, need the support and the, and the, the love during these really difficult times. So uh, I'm very honored to be able to give this proclamation today and um, to recognize September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas the char character of our community is in how we treat our most vulnerable, and whereas each year, one in every 100 children in our community will be diagnosed with cancer, and whereas cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease among children, more than asthma, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, fibrosis, congenital anomalies and AIDS combined. And whereas during the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services has been keeping medically fragile children and families housed, fed, and emotionally supported by steadfastly adhering to the following commitments. One, parents of children with cancer and other serious illnesses will be relieved of financial fears and able to focus their attention on their children. Two, no child undergoing intensive treatment in our community will be homeless. Three, families of seriously ill children will not experience food insecurity during and after the pandemic. And four, no seriously ill child in our community will ever miss a medical appointment because of a lack of transportation. And whereas Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services holds the memories and the legacy legacies of hundreds of children from our local community who have been lost to cancer, ensuring that their memories will never be forgotten. And whereas the oncology department at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford has worked closely with Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for the past 23 years as a trusted community partner in providing family-centered care that addresses the emotional, practical, financial struggles of families of children with cancer in the city of Santa Cruz. And whereas it is important for all Santa Cruz residents to recognize the impact of pediatric cancer on families within our community and honor the children in our community whose lives have been cut short by cancer. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2021 as Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in honoring Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for its 23 years of outstanding support to our community and acknowledging its contributions to Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Um, Daniela, thank you so much for all the work you do, and um, we'd love to hear from, from you today if you'd like, um, but I'm um, very honored for you and recognize Jacob's Heart and all the kids um, in Santa Cruz who unfortunately have experienced this in their lives. Did you want to say anything, Daniela, or are you just here to, to receive the proclamation? I wasn't sure. And Bonnie, I wasn't sure if she can unmute her or if there's anything that you would like to see, Dan. See. Okay, looks, there you are. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Mayor uh, Myers, for proclaiming September as Childhood Awareness Month. I think it's a huge step in just increasing awareness, and it is a true pleasure to serve the children and families in our county. Thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next is item number seven, uh, which is our library mixed use project update. <clears throat> this is the quarterly update that the council directed be done. Um, and so um, today is the day for, or this month is the month of that quarterly update. And I'll introduce Bonnie Lipscomb, our director of economic uh, development to provide the presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. We'll be giving the quarterly update um, today. 
and we've made a lot of progress over the summer, and I'm really excited to introduce some of our um, project team members to you today and to just give you an update on some of the activities over the summer. And with me today, um, and we'll have two parts today, we'll have the quarterly update uh, presentation now, and then a little bit later on the agenda, we'll actually go into detail on the library master architect. Um, but with me today for the project update is um, Tom Ottenstein, and he is with Griffin Structures, and he will be presenting a little bit, in a little bit later, and there he is, um, a little bit later about, in just a few minutes, about the project schedule and how we're, how we're doing on that. Um, but with that, I will share my screen and get started. So the project of where we are today Um, just going to go briefly over the summary of the efforts to date and introduce you to our project team. And then Tom will give you a brief schedule update and then we will talk about next steps. So just a, a few highlights of our efforts to date. We have completed with Griffin Structures the program delivery and schedule analysis on the overall timeline of the project and looking at the Measure S funding. Um, and so we've done that with Tom and with Griffin Structures. We've implemented some of the first steps around the communications and the outreach strategy. I'll go over the, those in the last quarterly update. Um, we've started implementing some of those communication tools during the revisioning process that we did for the current library site, including some of the pop-up events and stakeholder meetings, and we'll continue that as that goes forward. Um, we've completed the library, as I mentioned, reuse visioning process. We engaged through that process and with our partners, Project for Public Spaces and Group over 700 um, members of the community. We've gone through an RFP process for our affordable housing master developer to develop 100% more low and very low income units um, than the council direction. And just to um, provide a little background and context, um, we did have a council direction that we are implementing at this point that dates back to June of 2020. And um, from that council direction, we are moving forward our project team and moving forward on designing some of the conceptual concepts, some of the concepts behind uh, what the library project, mixed use project and affordable housing will look like. So that's what we're moving on today is assessing that project team. And then later today, we'll have the recommendation for the master library architect request for proposals and selection. So specifically, we've hired our owner's rep, Griffin, Griffin Structures, and over the summer, we've been working with them on um, both of the RFP process for the library architect as well as the affordable housing master developer. And just to refresh since it's been some time since we've come before you, Griffin Structures has a, a, just a depth of experience in the public sector on affordable housing, library experience, mixed use development, as well as all the way through construction management. So to have them be part of our team and it's been a pleasure to work um, with their full team. And here's just showing the number of projects that they've completed in their, in their uh, many years of experience doing public sector projects. And here is their full team, and we have had the pleasure to work with all of them. So far, our day-to-day -day is Tom, and you'll meet him in a few minutes. He's great to work with, very detail-oriented, um, and just on top of the schedule. So it's, it's been great to sort of see, particularly as they come forward in the project team, really moving, really moving forward and staying on schedule. Um, our communications and outreach strategies, these are the tools that we've been using. Um, just because of the level of community engagement and interest in this project, we have implemented a, just a wide variety of tools and communication outreach, um, sort of a strategy to make sure that we're reaching um, different members of the community and engaging them in different ways. So from our upcoming uh, conceptual and schematic design workshops and focus groups that we'll be having, um, numerous stakeholder meetings and presentations. We'll have pop-up events, social media posts, um, regular just e-blast updates. We'll have a fact sheet that we update regularly that posts on our website. And all of our website content is on the cityofsantacruz.com uh, slash mixed use library. So you can go straight there and get regular updates on the project. We'll have general, um, we've had a few already press releases um, quarterly updates to council. This is our third. This is actually the fourth time we've come to you this year if we're including the revisioning process presentation, but this is officially our third quarterly update. 
And then once we get to construction, we'll 24 hour hotline um, during construction. So just to um, refresh um, and for members of the, of the community, we did complete the revisioning process in June. It was a four month process and this was a uh, collaboration with Project for Public Spaces in group four. They did quite extensive outreach reaching over 700 community members through their various events, including pop-ups, a survey where they had 720 responses to their survey. And the outcome of that event, and this is consistent with the council direction from the previous, um, from the previous year, um, is that for the existing library site, so revisioning what that library site could be once the library moves to their new home, is a, a preferred project um, with mixed use um, housing, with housing really being emphasized, and this is the diagram on the far right, um, with a, a really engaged civic and plaza park. So affordable housing front and center, community orient oriented ground floor uses, a civic plaza and park focused on downtown uses and the potential to host the farmer's market. And we engage the farmer's market in this process today. They're excited for the possibility of this site. Um, we recognize that there still will need to be an interim site just given the, the timing of when the library would move and when we would need um, to have um, access for um, the new site. So we're, we're, we're ongoing communications with them and it's been a, a really good partnership. So uh, the process, I just wanna give a little bit of the process for the selection of the affordable housing master developer and that request for um, proposals process and our selection and how, and how we got here. So we posted the proposal, um, the RFP in April Five firms submitted, uh, First Community Housing Related, John Stewart Company, Eden Housing and For the Future, and Novin, um, Novin Development. All proposals were evaluated based on uh, an initial sort of checklist and um, matrix criteria that exists the project team, path related experience, design and program, and the approach to scope, including affordability. Based on that, um, we selected Eden, the, the combined team of Eden and For the Future, and it's a of pretty much every category across the board, including just, a, just an incredibly strong team and partnership. You have Eden, just, a, you know, decades of experience in affordable housing development and expertise in financing combined with For the Future that has done some incredible affordable housing projects in our community and the larger region. And so the combination of that team is just really, really strong. Their approach to scope and, and their responsiveness to the RFP, very detailed. They were the team that um, not only met our criteria for affordability and deep levels of affordability in the project, but they exceeded it. Um, and they more than doubled the number of units um, that were proposed as a bare minimum requirement in the RFP. So over 100, 107 units um, that they proposed all 50% or below of area median income. So I'll talk more about that in just a second, but that's pretty exciting. Um, so Eden Housing and For the Future Housing, um, as I mentioned, they proposed over 107 very low and extremely low income housing units. That's the very lowest level of income um, that is included in our regional housing needs assessment allocation. That's important and I'll come back to that. Um, their proposal and program for the site includes supportive services for residents, potential on-site childcare, commitment to sustainability, rooftop solar, rainwater catchment systems, and an all electric low energy building. They have, as I mentioned, just 64 years, decades of combined years of experience with projects completed or underway in Santa Cruz County. Um, I've already mentioned the last two, so I won't go into those, but as you can tell, we're pretty excited that we have a team of this caliber working on the project. And it's just been our pleasure so far to have some preliminary meetings with them as we start to pull the team together and just be able to tap into their expertise, their creativity, um, and their, their experience um, in this region. So I wanted to talk Rena, um, the uh, Deputy City Manager Lee, Lee Butler, our, also our Planning uh, Director, brought this up in a recent presentation in the study session. And I wanted to bring this back up because it relates to this project. 
So as you see the regional housing needs um, assessment allocation and you look at the progress that we've made in Santa Cruz towards that, you'll see we have actually done well. With, with saying that, there is a need, and you can see that in this very low category. This is 50% and low and lower, right here in the very low category. And as you can see, we have 123 units that we still need to complete. We've met all of the other benchmarks for this period, which is great. However, the hardest units to create are typically done in public-private partnerships, with done with a public subsidy, so done with projects. During redevelopment days, these are the projects we were doing. This is what has been the struggle since 2012, is being able to create projects at this very lowest level of affordability because they are just so hard to finance. So moving forward with projects like this one, um, where the city is a partnership and we can commit our fund to this, we can underwrite the value of the land, we can leverage, um, particularly in a mixed use project, just makes so much sense. And we'll be able to address almost all of the remaining need um, on our on our arena um, allocation just through this project alone. So I, w I wanted to highlight that because I think it's really important we've been talking about um, our arena need um, for this project. The other exciting thing is to mention is this isn't the only project um, in that for our next period, as uh, Lee alluded to in our study session, um, we think that the um, arena for the next period may be three times as large as far as what we need to, to achieve. And so our two other projects that we're working on will be so critical. All three of these projects are going to be critical for us addressing our arena needs in the next nine-year period. So here it is highlighted. Sorry, I should have gone to this one first. Um, as you can see, this project will be creating units entirely within this category, this category of most need. Um, this is just to show you a few of their projects. Um, this are, these are projects for, for the future. Um, these are in um, Santa Cruz. The uh, one on the right, the Riverwalk Apartments, was actually created first. This is 21 units. Um, and this is a project that we did actually with redevelopment funding um, with For the Future um, back in, gosh, this was back in, we started in 2012, finished in, 20, in 2015. Um, the project on the right, on the left, is the Water Street uh, Apartments that was recently completed. That's 41 units. Um, it's another great project, and this is a project of an example of one of the reasons why we're so excited to work with uh, For the Future as part of our affordable housing master developer team is because of the community engagement that um, Jim Rindler and his team really did with the community to create a project that really met with some of the criteria that the community felt, both architecturally um, and some of the benefits, so that it really was integrated into the community and well-received. Um, another project that they're working on is, the, is our Pack Station South project in downtown Santa Cruz. And this is the project on the left. Um, and this will be another 70 units of affordable housing, all, all in that low income. This is the area that we're targeting for that project as well. And then here's another project that they're working on in Fremont. And as many projects, I'm not going to go into all the details of these, um, but you can see Altamira and Hayward, um, Hanna Gardens and, and Senior Apartments and El Cerrito. Um, projects in Dublin, Fremont. I mean, they're just so well known and respected in the in the Bay Area region and in California at large. Um, so I'm only briefly um, going to um, go into the criteria and the background for the master library architect process because we're going to be going into that in a, a lot of detail a little bit later. But I just want to highlight because this has been part of what we've been working on over the summer. Um, we had a very similar process for the selection of the master library architect. Obviously, the uh, preliminary review and the matrix um, was, you know, heavy emphasis, obviously, on the design and the program and the experience as related to that. did have um, four teams um, were interviewed following um, that we received proposals from nine. And Jason Architecture was selected as the preferred master library architect, and that is before you today. And that was really based on, you know, strong team, their approach to scope, um, really the quality and success of their community engagement, which is just outstanding. And um, the number of projects currently in the region for the Santa Cruz Public Library System, it's, 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 it's pretty exciting. 
And so with that, um, a little bit later today, you'll be meeting Abe, Abe Jason, and Katie Stewart, and they'll be presenting actually um, their sort of approach to scope and how they do community engagement and how they see the project at large. So I'm looking forward to the presentation. And um, again, this is sort of part of how they approach their project um, and how they look at it, sort of take a, a step back and look at the big picture and how they engage with the community and for all of the projects that they do. Here's just some of their projects, and this is the recently completed Campbell Library. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Tom to just take a minute or two and just talk about our project schedule and um, where we are um, with that. We're still in the team building phase, although we're getting to the end, end of that, which is great, um, within the third quarter, which we're in the third quarter of 2021. So we are right on schedule, but I'm going to see if Tom wants to add a few words to that. Oh, well, thank you, Bonnie, and uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. So as, uh, as Bonnie has just highlighted, uh, the, the most recent efforts of the last year have, have been to build the team, uh, selecting the affordable housing partner, selecting the uh, master architect, um, getting into the, the basis of the communication and, and planning for community outreach. Uh, starting immediately upon uh, approval of the award of the master architect contract, we'll be working uh, with both teams to get into the design and permitting phase. Uh, that's expected to last about a, a year. Um, there is, a, as Bonnie noted, a, a tremendous amount of community outreach which will take place during that process, iterative in each step, um, but ultimately ending up in a set of documents that can be set, uh, put out to bid for competitive bidding purposes and contractor selection at the end of 2022, which would then lead us into the most fun phase, which is the construction, um, expected to last approximately two years, um, starting with clearing the site and the grading, uh, building the shell of the building, if you will, fitting out the interiors of the library, and then ultimately the final uh, site work and landscape. Expectation that wrapping up the end of 2024, uh, and then beginning the move-in process uh, in 2025 to open the library end of the second quarter. I just wanna say thank you, uh, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to work on this project with you. Thanks, Tom. So next step, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next presentation as well, um, but we are going to have quite a bit of community outreach um, on site concepts in the very early sort of conceptual design, continuing through schematic design. It's really the time for a, quite a bit of engagement with the community. So right off the bat, we'll be looking at some stakeholder focus groups in October, continuing into November um, on really sort of the big site concepts and how do the pieces fit together and what are the programmatic elements that really need to be in the look and feel. And we'll continue with some workshops in November and December, as well as coming back to council with some overall site concepts, major design, you know, sort of concepts as well with that for council feedback and direction. Um, in December, and then the design team will go back and start working, um, you know, more intensively on the schematic designs, moving into the next phases of the project. Have a series of touch points, but quite a bit of community engagement. And I'll go through a little bit more of that um, in the next presentation. And then we'll also continue um, with our conversations and um, some of the work that we're doing with the farmers market. We're just we're staying engaged right now. They were engaged in the revisioning process. Um, for the existing library site and are excited about the possibilities that that site has long term for the farmer's market. We're also continuing our conversations on lot seven and you know what could be there and could that be a good interim site um, for the farmer's market and then what other possibilities might be out there. You know, maybe it's a street closure, maybe it's Pacific Avenue, maybe it's some other combination. So we're going through all of that with the farmer's market um, and just staying engaged. And they, as I mentioned earlier, have been um, really willing to participate with us and a great partner. And then, um, as I mentioned, we'll come back to council, um, both with our, our uh, latest quarterly update in December, as well as a presentation and a request for some direction on the overall site design. 
And with that, that concludes uh, our presentation. Um, thank you for your time today. If you have any questions, please, please let us know. Thank you very much, Bonnie. That was, um, you fit a lot into that 10 minutes. Well done. <laughs> a lot of progress, very exciting. Um, so uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, if there, uh, Justin, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to start by um, expressing my appreciation for this presentation because I, a number of people have been kind of wondering what's happening and how all the pieces fit together. So just wanted to make that comment that um, people have been asking and it's good to see um, how everything's coming together, especially the affordable housing component because um, a lot of folks have been wondering, is that gonna happen? How much of that you know, is actually gonna be affordable housing? So it really helps for us to be able to communicate uh, these kinds of updates to the community and really help ease their concerns around whether or not this is gonna happen. Um, I, I have one I wanna, question. I just, I just wanna real quick, just make sure that um, this is just a presentation, so typically we don't get into a lot of back and forth, um, but certainly there's time for you to definitely follow up with staff, but I just wanna make sure we're clear, this is just a presentation. This is not an item for discussion and, and deliberation at this point. Fully aware. Um, I had a question about the, um, the re-envisioning portion of, the, of this conversation and this presentation. So um, it seems like that timeline that, that's been laid out, that's really focusing on the downtown library mixed use project. And in addition to that, there's gonna be other conversations around um, the kind of re-envisioning of the current site. And so those are gonna be two separate questions, two separate timelines moving forward. That's, that's correct, is that correct? That's right. I, I will say that um, once we get to the part of where we actually have permits and are starting construction, I think we'll 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 keep that going with the construction management. Where we really will pivot quite a bit to the existing library site and the future of that because we can't engage and like we can't put out a new RFP until we know when the timing of when we're going to have site control for that. So at that point, we can pull together you know a new RFP you know for you know, um, interest in doing a mixed use, you know, affordable housing project and the, and the elements that were presented in the, in the final presentation for the revisioning process. Thank you. And then um, one more follow-up too, because um, people have been reaching out with questions regarding, um, you know, how the project is coming along in terms of who's responsible for the different pieces. And I, I'll speak to this more when we talk about this item later on, but um, it seems like Griffin Structures is really the one who's kind of the umbrella group that's pulling in the different affordable housing um, developers and uh, whoever's gonna be in charge of the parking and the library. And today, this afternoon, we're really gonna be focusing on, we have the discussion about the library development piece. It's really gonna focus on Jason and how they're gonna approach kind of building that library. Because what people have been concerned with is, you know, how, how do we get all these people together and all this together. And so just wanted to see if there's any comments on that, so that we have some clarification when we speak to members of the public. Yeah, I mean, that's really why we, we put out our initial RFP um, to and ended up with Griffin Structures, just so that we would have an owner's representative that has the depth of experience that Tom and his team has. I mean, he really is, and I see Tom's on, so I'm gonna turn it over to him in a second. Um, but yeah, I just wanna make sure we're watching time. That, yeah. Okay, we, we need to keep moving, so thank you. Yeah, so these are, you know, on the ground, coordinating all the details, coordinating between the library, you know, all the city folks, all the stakeholders, and just making sure the project is running smoothly and that we have all the components necessary. And as I showed you earlier, you know, in their experience, they have, you know, so much experience doing exactly this. So with that, I'm just briefly turning it over to Tom. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. And, and just to keep it brief, yes, I, I am the orchestra leader or the ringleader or however you'd like to call it, making sure that uh, the deliverables are provided by all the entities that the city's hiring and that ultimately we get a successful project out of the entire group. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandy, or Council Member Brown. Thank you. 
I, I do have uh, some questions that are specifically related to the library component, so I'll save those for later. Um, but a couple that came up, which probably are outside of the scope for that item, so I just wanted to ask them now. Um, you know, a lot of the questions that I'm getting are, are kind of pretty broad questions around um, the state of financing. Uh, you know, we were working with cost projections based upon uh, you know, a fund balance from Measure S and fitting all these pieces together. And I'm just wondering if you could speak just briefly to how that's looking. Are um, are we sort of in the position to, to have the extra 5,000 square feet um, that there's going to be a shortfall for that? Are we in air rights in the conversations around with the affordable housing developer? Um, just kind of what what we should expect in terms of the you know the money you know to to come pay for this because as we know that we have construction cost escalation and all of the other um, challenges related to this pot of money the measure S money um, and there are other pots so just wondering if we get an update yeah sure um, so we're feeling pretty good about it actually and we've only at this point since we've just been in the process of assembling our team have uh, had preliminary conversations with our affordable housing master developer and ultimately what the actual cost for the project, we'll be able to do that once we have finalized what the overall site design is and what those mixes are and how they're fitting together. Because that's really where some of that leveraging will happen, where some of the cost savings will happen. It'll be based on some decisions that we'll bring before you um, most likely in December. Would be would be would be my approximate time frame of when we'll be able to really hone in on that of what the costs are, how we're able to leverage financing. But from our preliminary discussions with the team, we're all feeling pretty good about the bucks and where we are with the project. Thank you. And then one other question about where things are at with total fitness um, and whether that's going to just how, where that fits. Yeah, I mean, you know, just in the past, we've just, you know, are reaching out to um, Christoph at Total Fitness and trying to figure out, are they in the project or are we going to be working with relocating them somewhere else in the downtown? So we're just keeping that dialogue going. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Any other questions? We are good to go. Well, thank you, Bonnie, and nice to meet you, Tom, and we look forward to hearing more as you put this all together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into our um, the rest of our meeting here today. Uh, I do have a few announcements, and then we will move into the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment today during our meeting are numbers 10 through 25 I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. I'm seeing no hand. We have no statements of disqualification from council members today. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to the, um, to the agenda today. There are none. Um, with regards to oral communications, this is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that not, are not on the agenda today. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 24. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 24. And just for clarification for folks, uh, number 24, I believe, is the... Um, will be the um, item regarding the um, downtown, downtown mixed use library. So if you have looked at the agenda and you're remembering by topic, that's when that will, oral communications will occur after that. 
Okay, um, I will ask our city attorney, Tony Kadati, to provide a report on closed session, please. Yes, afternoon, uh, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. Uh, this morning at 9 a.m., the council met in closed session to discuss the following items. Uh, item one was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims. Uh, the claimants are Kelly D. Girolamo and Noe Castaneda. Uh, those are also listed on your afternoon agenda as item number 14 uh, this afternoon. Two was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. The first existing litigation item was the matter of City of Santa Cruz versus Richard L. Santee et al., currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Uh, council received a report from and gave direction to its legal counsel on that matter. Item two uh, is the matter entitled Heita Singh versus City of San Diego, case currently pending in the Fourth Appellate District uh, in uh, San Diego County. On that matter, the council authorized the mayor to send an amicus letter in support of the City of San Diego's appeal in that case. Um, that amicus letter will be uh, available publicly once the uh, letter is finalized in, in that matter. Uh, item three was an item involving significant exposure to litigation in which the council received a report from its legal counsel. There was no reportable action. And item four was real property negotiations involving property owned by the city on Front Street and designated as uh, assessor's parcel numbers 00515148 and 0515135. Council received a report from its negotiator, uh, Economic Dir Development Director Lipscomb, concerning negotiations for the potential sale of that property to uh, SCFS Hotel Venture LLC. There's no reportable action on that item. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Tony. We'll now move on to item number eight on our agenda. And I'd like to call on our interim city manager, Rosemary Menard, to provide the city manager report. Good afternoon, mayor and council members. Um, I have three brief items for you today uh, from Rob Odie, the fire chief, will give a Update on the status of COVID, followed by uh, Lee Butler, um, our deputy uh, city manager and planning and community development director, who's going to give you a quick update on homelessness. And then we have Kathy Minsk from the economic development department, who's going to talk to you about some murals, some exciting uh, murals that are happening in our community. And then I'm going to give a quick update on the planned Saturday meeting on the uh, California Voter Rights Act. Um, district election issue that um, we, I want to make sure people know about. So with that, uh, Chief Odie. You're muted, Chief. There we go. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and Council. Um, just a brief update. I'll try and keep it short and sweet. And of course, answer any questions you may have based on this information. Um, I sat in on a, a COVID clinician meeting this morning, so I have some uh, slides that unfortunately weren't able to be updated, but I have uh, supporting information and I'll, I'll plug it in where appropriate. Um, basically, um, right now, the outlook for COVID is, is relatively optimistic in terms of the Delta surge. Um, Gail Newell, the uh, director for this county, um, feels as though we have peaked and that we're flattening the curve and that the Delta surge is declining. Um, cases are trending down, and over the last 14-day um, uh, period, we've gone from a 14% decrease, 21% decrease, and as of today, it was a 30% decrease in the last 14 days. Uh, transmissibility has gone from high to moderate. Um, on another good note, our vaccine rates um, are tending um, in the right direction. They're going up. Um, They've administered 358,000 plus doses thus far. Um, we've reached just, just under the goal the county set of 70% vaccination by July 1st. Um, there's still a lot of work in this area. It seems as has to do with um, sort of the younger folks in the county um, in the 30s to 40s range um, that are still reluctant to get this vaccine. Um, as a result, 
result of this surge and just um, a various variants that are out there, uh, we stood up the EOC again remotely just so that uh, as we um, order supplies, um, we, that we appropriately track our expenditures for a FEMA reimbursement as needed. Next slide. Um, so this was one of the new features they actually showed. I was able to uh, tear down um, this data from July 1st till today to basically sort of show us uh, that we are flattening that curve. That's the graph on the left. Uh, the graph on the right actually is somewhat important because um, we've seen a shift um, in sort of this latter part of the pandemic. Um, initially, uh, a lot of the uh, transmission was done person to person within households. And now you can see it's um, almost 62% of it is person to person, community acquired. A lot of that uh, they um, think has to do with, you know, the relaxing of some of the restrictions, um, people sort of feeling comfortable about having the vaccines and not wearing masks. Um, so again, still something of a concern. And of course, with the recent holiday and some large events in the county over this weekend, um, they, they're definitely keeping an eye on this number. Next slide. Hospitalization rates in Santa Cruz County, again, they were spiking. Um, they, they are starting to level off. We have five ICU beds available. Um, overall, hospitalizations at our two facilities um, are decreasing. There are currently 12 patients in the hospital currently. 11 of them are unvaccinated. So again, lends itself to that uh, the vaccination prevents severe illness from COVID-19. Um, so again, the messaging is uh, still a work in progress. Next slide. Uh, again, in terms of vaccination rates in the county, as I mentioned, we're just below that 70% target. Um, um, in contrast, the state of California um, is also about the 70% range with, of course, target and desire of being 80 to 90% to effectively combat the Delta variant and any other variants that we may encounter such as Lambda or the Mu. Um, just for context, um, the update on the Mu variant is it basically comprises about the 0.1% of the cases. That's nationally, there's 432 in the state of California, none in Santa Cruz. Um, and again, it's uh, keep in mind that the around since January of this year. Um, so it just sort of provides a little bit of context as to the fact that Delta is much more transmissible and sort of the issue that we're trying to deal with um, right now. And again, they're finding that the new variant itself is less uh, transmissible. Next slide. Um, so again, as I mentioned, um, the last 14 days, this was updated uh, as of last week, um, the 8th of September, but this morning um, was that it's down actually 30%. They just had not updated the website um, for me to use the slide. But again, all good news in terms of the 14-day trend heading downward. Next slide. Um, and again, um, this slide is a little bit outdated, only in the sense that uh, the R number, which is basically the value of transmissibility uh, in our county, um, as you can see um, early on, uh, it was uh, well above, almost approaching two. We are currently down below one, which is sort of the uh, Mason-Dixon line, if you will. And we're actually approaching more towards that 0.75%. So again, um, all good news in terms of uh, transmissibility in our county. Next slide. And again, um, just a lot of new information that has been added to the Santa Cruz Health.org slash COVID in terms of um, vaccination information for anybody, again, pass that along. Um, the message is to get more people vaccinated so that we can, um, again, come um, get through this Delta surge and anything else that we may be facing in the future. And that's all I have unless there's any questions on COVID. Are there any questions for Chief Odie? I see uh, Councilmember Contar jump. Thank you, Chief Odie, for the presentation. Um, just a quick question. Do you know if the county provides a breakdown of um, the vaccinations by ethnicity or geographic area? Um, yes, they do. And again, that was part of um, one of the slides I talked to you about. They had a, a sliding scale where you can look at um, uh, basically the entire pandemic or um, short segments of it. Again, I selected from July 1st till today um, since that was specific to the Delta surge. Um, on that same website, SantaCruzHealth.org slash COVID-19, 
um, they do break down all the specific questions that you have in terms of age, race, and uh, location within the county. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Chief Bodie? Okay, well, welcome, Chief. We'll look forward to it. All right, thank you. Thank you. So next we have um, Steve Butler with homelessness. Thank you, Rosemary, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm going to go through a number of quick updates and uh, we'll be available for questions at the end as well. So uh, it's an issue that's coming up that I think you are all aware of and many in the community are aware of is the uh, wind down of various COVID related shelters that the county has been operating. We continue to have um, conversations with the county about um, how that um, wind down will affect our city as well as what we can do to minimize the um, implications of that. Um, as you know, they have the rehousing wave um, that they're working on um, and have many people registered. They have um, uh, housed about 35 people. So, um, you know, not as, as quick a start as we would like to see, but hopefully um, the, the recent trend of increasing those numbers can continue. Um, there are three um, remaining hotels in the city um, where the county is um, uh, providing shelter. There are about 100 guests in those hotels. Um, and then in, in other areas of the county, um, there are hotels that are slated to close as well. Um, at this point, there is at least there's, there is one that is going to um, uh, remain open through the end of the year, and that's a, a fairly large hotel. It has um, rooms, so that one would uh, continue to operate for um, an extended, at least through the end of the year. Um, the Armory, um, there are three programs that the county is operating up at the Armory right now, and there are about 115 people in those. The county is in the process of um, beginning the demobilization there, which will start in, and run through October, their current plan. And the city is looking at um, utilizing that, um, that site as a safe sleeping location. Um, we are um, evaluating the proposals that we have. We did receive another proposal uh, in response to our RFQ for a um, large safe sleeping uh, operation. And um, we are targeting uh, a return in October with a contract and a recommendation for that operator. Um, the, uh, with the hiring that's necessary, that would put a um, operation of the safe sleeping um, circa early December. Um, so that's, that's kind of the timeline that we're on right now. Um, simultaneously, we're looking at where we can set up a storage for um, and that would likely be paired with the uh, pickup locations um, for transportation to and from the armory. And we're looking at uh, potential grant sources for um, helping to fund um, part of uh, the um, safe sleeping operations. Um, moving to the, um, the bench lands, there are um, a number of staff working down there right now. Um, we've got two um, part-time temporary staff who are regularly there, as well as um, a number of folks throughout many of our departments who are there helping um, with uh, rule compliance and uh, trash collection and service provision, like um, continuing access to drinking water there. Um, some brief stats on that. Um, there have been 14 county, county shelter placements at this point. Um, a variety of housing placements through things like um, HUD, VASH, HUD's VASH program um, or people moving in with friends, um, including five homeward bound tickets. Um, there's been direct coordination with the Rebley Family Shelter to assist a group there. Um, countless referrals to various service providers and then um, there were recently installed four additional stations for sharks collection, Narcan um, and fire extinguishers. Um, the council is likely aware that um, the project home key um, notice of funding availability was released last um, and the application will be available as of September 30th. 
the State Department of Housing and Community Development is hosting a webinar that same day to walk through the process and um, applications will be accepted through May 2nd of 2022 or until all funds are expended. We have a number of projects that we're looking at that could potentially qualify and we've been coordinating with the county as well as nonprofit uh, partners who have expressed interest in those. So there will be more info to come on that topic in the future. Um, in addition to coordinating on Project Home Key, we've also been initiating conversations with others with respect to the $14.5 million that's coming in through the state. The mayor has been coordinating with the um, uh, state representatives in um, John Laird's and Mark Stone's office to get a meeting for um, a better understanding of um, what strings will be attached to that and how we um, can ultimately spend that money. That's all that I have for today and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Questions from council members? Council Member Brown? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Director Butler, for the update, um, or Deputy City Manager Butler. I um, am just wondering, I'm looking at the, the timing on the siting, uh, the armory site, and I'm just thinking about the, the move. So the county is going to be um, demobilizing, and then we, if all goes well, we can get in there with a potential contractor. And that looks like it might leave uh, a window. Um, so have you talked at all about what the displacement of people who would then end up coming back? I mean, it's a, it's a huge process, I know, to move people um, without anywhere to go. I'll just remind us all. Um, and then kind of reopen. Is there any possibility for streamlining that transition that you are discussing? Yes, yeah, so, so there is a uh, potential for that. Um, that will, in large part, it's going to depend on a number of factors. Um, with the um, new um, uh, response to our RFQ, um, you know, the, the particular operator that is selected um, could influence the exact start, the exact start time. And so that transition um, could um, be lengthened depending on um, how much hiring is needed and how quickly that hiring can happen. Um, so that is certainly a concern um, that we have is that that gap, the November gap um, between if, if it's going to take someone, you know, a month to get uh, staff hired and on board, then um, uh, there would be that. So we are working to try and minimize that. And um, it's, it's still to be determined whether or not that can be the case. But we are certainly cognizant of it and, and concerned about it as well. It, it could also save money if, if, if there's a way to do it in that way. So thinking about the financing too. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Cummings and then Councilmember Colin Charlie Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I had a couple questions. <clears throat> One to follow up on the Armory conversation. So um, back when I was on the two by two for the past two years, one of the issues with the Armory is that the Army is supposed to be going in and doing renovations at some point. And um, because of COVID and other issues, we were able to kind of move in and utilize that space. But I'm just wondering if there's many updates um, from the Army on how long we would be anticipated to use that given that they were wanting to kind of get in um, prior to us utilizing it this last time to make renovations. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. That was um, something that we wanted to look into as well. And I've had conversations with the National Guard Armory um, representatives and um, <laughs> they were um, looking to um, get tenant improvements done there and move in relatively quickly. So you're absolutely correct. That was back in um, March of 2020. And, you know, we know a lot of things have changed since then. Um, one of the things that they have said is, you know, what they were planning at that point is essentially off the table right now. They do want to do that at some point in the future. Um, they have expressed a willingness to work with us on that timing. 
and they have um, expressed flexibility in that. But at some point in the future, there would be um, approximately a two year period, you know, 18 months at the minimum, but probably two years the way construction goes, um, when um, that site would be unavailable. Um, they do believe that once that is back in operation, um, they would um, be able to work with us for a sort of nighttime safe sleeping um, facility, um, whereas they occupy it during the day for their operations and we um, uh, operate it in the evening times for the safe sleeping. So that could remain, but there's certainly a two year gap when um, that construction's happening that it wouldn't be available. And, and we have, um, you know, kicked around some ideas with them about how um, we could potentially um, address that scenario, but nothing concrete at this point. Great, thanks. And then just to follow up to that, I know that we're kind of getting to that time of year where, um, you know, the Benchlands is an area of concern, given that it's a floodplain. And so I'm just wondering if that's kind of been identified for, you know, what we're going to do as we're approaching the rainy season and knowing that that can be, you know, a public health safety risk for the people who are in the Benchlands. Thank you. Yes, we've had a number of internal discussions regarding that, and I know um, Rosemary's former uh, uh, department, the water department, has also been looking at some um, statistics related to that so that um, we have a, a good understanding of when individuals could potentially be in harm's way so that um, as we look at um, the, the weather patterns, we can understand better whether or not there is a potential for flooding location. Um, there is certainly that potential. We saw that back in 2017, as uh, you all will, will recall, um, but that was you know, obviously a very heavy rain year. And so um, that is you know, what we uh, are doing with the um, bench lands is um, something that we are talking about on a regular basis to um, come up with those, those plans and to hopefully align them with some of the other resources that we're bringing online. Right, and then real brief last question. Um, is there any thoughts around 1020 River Street reopening or has, has there been any discussion around that now that the construction, I, I believe the construction's done over there. Thanks. That's uh, at 1220, yeah. Yes, at, at 1220 River Street, yes, that is um, something that we've been discussing as well is utilization of that site as a resource. And Rosemary and I have had um, conversations just in the past couple of weeks related to that. And we do see that as an additional potential resource um, and um, that that could serve um, as a number of different functions, um, whether it's a um, uh, encampment or storage or some combination of the two, um, it's, it's still yet to be seen, but um, we, we do think that that will be a resource as part of our um, overall uh, service. Great, thanks. And then just a quick comment. I know that um, at the end of the month, I believe the eviction protections are gonna be um, ending um, the COVID-19. Um, and so it might be good if we could get a presentation or just some updates on what's happening there. I recently received a letter from an individual who was, um, they live outside of the city, but they were, more or less told by um, people who they work with in the county that the county was overwhelmed with their applications at the moment and they didn't, they weren't able to process her is dealing with a, a, an illegal eviction situation where she got served a notice during a time period when we're not supposed to be, um, landlords aren't supposed to be issuing tenants notices to quit for um, evictions. So, um, you know, to the extent we can understand how these resources are getting out and maybe updates to people who might be coming up on that, um, eviction clip, I think it would be helpful so that we're getting as many resources to people as possible. So, thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll work with the city attorney's office on that. And I've heard some anecdotes as well about the resources coming down from the state and the speed at which that's happening. Pepper, did you, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Commentary Johns, do you have a question? I did, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and all the work. 
director butler um and it's really good to hear about some of the housing permanent housing placements even though they're not in high numbers every every placement counts um one question i had for clarification is the the funds that are the project home key funds that are being released at the end of September and would be open till May, will they be, will the state be um, rewarding the proposals as they come in or will they wait until end of May? They are um, doing uh, a rolling award. Okay. So, so it's not um, everything waits until May. Um, it's, it's until um, May or until funds are extended and um, I'm going from memory here, but it's, it's a very significant number. I think it's slightly over $2 billion that they're looking at. It was, it was a significant number. So um, it, we would be, it would be best for us to have our plan and move quickly in terms of submitting a proposal, it sounds like. That's, that's correct. And from what I'm understanding is that we're already in conversation with nonprofits in the county and, and potentially joint proposals. That is correct. Part of um, what the Home Key looks at is um, service provision over an extended period of time. Um, and so, you know, in exchange for um, those infrastructure investments, it's looking at a commitment for um, uh, the uh, support that mm -hmm. provided to the individuals in the housing, for example. And um, that is something that is typically county role and so anything that we're doing we would be looking to partner with a nonprofit or with the county to help provide that that sort of back-end service okay great and then just one last question and i don't know if you have this information um you mentioned all the hotels that'll be closing and, and i know that there will be hotels in watsonville at least one that's closing um what the county or other jurisdictions plans are in terms of supporting those who will be um, forced to leave the hotels as they close. Um, what, what's the city of Watsonville doing? I mean, I know we're trying to stand up safe sleeping sites. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that. And then those are my questions, so I'll mute myself. Sir, I don't know specifically what the city of Watsonville is doing. Um, you know, we are in communication with them through on a regular basis. Um, but haven't had uh, those specific conversations about their um, actions and their responses to this. Um, we've had more conversations with the county and um, the county is exploring various options, um, including with um, potential home key um, applications. Um, but it is, you know, it's a substantial number of, of individuals and, um, at this point, you know, they, they've had a big push towards the, the rehousing wave and they've got uh, services like abode services on board trying to connect people um, who have, we've got a, a substantial number of um, uh, housing choice Section 8 vouchers um, countywide. The challenge has been finding those um, landlords who um, are, are um, willing to accept individuals into the um, into their homes and um, use the Section 8 vouchers. And some of those, a large number of those vouchers are actually available for any um, location throughout the country that has a house. So I think there are 100 different regions or so throughout the country where they could be utilized. Um, so the, the county is looking at how they might cast a, a wider net if individuals have connections in other areas that may have a, a greater amount of housing availability. Thank you. Hey, thanks Lee, that was great. Lots of information and things going on there. Um, the final brief presentation is from Kathy Mintz is gonna give you the feel good portion of today's uh, program <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to talk about murals. Okay. Thank, thanks, uh, City Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Bonnie uh, Bush has my presentation to put up to share the screen. Um, I'm a, Kathy Mintz, a manager in economic development responsible for city arts programming. And the first uh, update that I was going to give you that I'd like to give you is about the Black Lives Matter mural. That's the next slide. There was uh, a short um, 
proceeding uh, about two weeks ago, the current, the current desire of the Santa Cruz Equity Club is to work through the uh, public justice system to try and get the court to mandate a, some restorative action type of, uh, of um, outcome. So the, there were two vandals and they've got the charges of vandalism, two defendants, the charges and hate crimes. And there was a short proceeding uh, about two weeks ago on September 8th, actually. The court was uh, considering the request from the public defender to do a little test to see if the skid marks on the mural could be washed off either with steam cleaning or with a chemical treatment. And it was explained to the court, well, can't just go out and start doing something on the street, particularly with chemicals. So when uh, the judge realized the complications in that and the, in the, city's, uh, the city's position that any kind of test would probably further damage the mural. She directed the defendant to do some uh, tests, have expert testing done someplace else on some other site if they want. And she directed the city to produce the detailed restoration plan that, um, that we have in mind. So that plan will be developed by the Santa Cruz Equity Collab, basically the cost that it will take to repaint the mural. The next court proceeding is October 7th, and at that one, it's my understanding the judge will consider all the evidence against the defendants and decide if there's sufficient evidence to move on with the um, charges that are being presented. So we'll be uh, watching that date. So now for the better uh, news in the next slide, Seawald Santa Cruz is uh, upon us right now. It's a program of the Pangea Seed Foundation, an international nonprofit organization based in Hawaii, acting at the intersection of culture and environmentalism for the ocean con conservation. The overall mission of that nonprofit is to empower individuals and communities to create meaningful environmental change for oceans through science, education, and artivism, as they call it, C, S-E-A. Their motto is a drop of paint can create an ocean of change. They've uh, responsible for over 400 murals in 17 countries around the world, including Vietnam, Canada, Estonia. Um, they're in Santa Cruz now. From here, they go to the Bahamas. On their website, which I'll show you later on, there's an interactive map where you can click on the location and you can see the art. And so it'll be really cool that Santa Cruz is gonna be on that map. The mission of this festival is to unify and inspire the local Santa Cruz community and visitors to stand up for our coastal resources. So again, the intersection of art and activism is to provoke conversation and action. So on the next slide, you can see uh, this festival in Santa Cruz was originally planned for 2020, but that obviously was sidelined because of COVID. But it's no surprise that Santa Cruz would be selected as a site given our community of climate change on our environment. We also have a special responsibility as the gateway to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to bring attention to the global environmental issues that impact our ecosystem. The festival is being led locally by Taylor Reinhold, Sadie Phillips, and the Made Fresh crew of, Act of Artivists. The base camp for the crew is the Tannery Arts Center. A tailor who many of you I'm sure know grew up in Santa Cruz and is responsible for the Mission Street Clean Oceans mural at Bayview Elementary, which was groundbreaking in itself. The City Arts Program through Economic Development is a major festival sponsor, along with Save Our Seas, South Swell Ventures, the Aqua Breeze Inn where the artists are being lodged, a tool shed, which has uh, right now, I think that the tailor has all of their equipment on. Uh, borrow, Lost Coast Plant Therapy, Smog Arbor, I'm sorry, Smog Armor, and Montana Cans, Paints, Patagonia, Treehouse. Those are just they're some of the major ones. Through Taylor's amazing energy and great deal of charm, he's garnered support from so many local businesses to support the festival, including community printers, roaring echo tours, and of course, restaurants uh, who are stepping up to feed the visiting artists with lunches and dinners, including Zockley's Shanty Shack, 
Snap Taco, Venus Spirits, Olita's Upper Crust Pizza, and that's just for these few days so far. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, I were around on Sunday that already, even before the painting started, Santa Cruz was looking dressed up. These walls <laughs> were cleaned and, uh, and sometimes patched and primed, ready for paint. The next slide is the backside of the so city SoCal front parking lot here in Lewis Lane. We've been uh, trying for some time to activate that space. You can see up in the upper left how it looked before, and then the bottom how it looked primed even was already better. And then this is a picture of one of the artists in action yesterday, uh, early afternoon. It looks quite a bit different already this morning. On the next uh, slide, you'll see the Metro parking lot side of the restaurant located on Front Street. The Maeve Fresh Crew scraped, patched that wall. You can see on the upper left how it looked before. Again, the lower one already painted, uh, ready for dress up. And then the shot uh, on the right is from lunchtime yesterday. It was about that same time that Shmuel Baylor was there and took his photo that was on the front page of the Sentinel this morning. So go take a walk. You'll see how it looks now. They're changing as we speak. Um, the next slide is just to give you an idea that the city stretch of this project is from the far west side to downtown to River Street and Sotel on the east side. These photos are of 619 and 730 Soquel. And there is a little funny story about the bottom wall at uh, 619 on York Frames. That wall was actually suggested for painting by Paul Martin, who many of you may know is the leader of economic development volunteer graffiti removal efforts and has um, been honored and acclaimed by the city. So we even had him stepping up to suggest walls that needed painting. And then on the final slide, um, I just want to say that this uh, whole effort has garnered a groundswell of enthusiasm. As a manager of the City Arts Facebook page, uh, to have a post get to reach 450 people in one day is really gratifying. Last week, uh, KSTD, Talk of the Bay, Taylor was interviewed by Rachel Goodman. Um, in the Sentinel, Rachel Kippen, wrote a lovely piece about Taylor, Sadie, and their work in, the, uh, in their work. And then Wallace Bain had a feature on them in Lookout recently. So for each festival, a beautiful video is produced that interviews the artist, shows the city, shows the murals, and is publicly posted on the Pangea Seed website and will be available to us um, as a teaching tool for environmental educators and also as a beacon to attract visitors to Santa Cruz. So we're really looking forward to having that as a final product in addition to all of the murals that we'll have throughout the city. So with that, um, I'm ready to take any questions you might have. I'll just make a quick comment. I believe working with economic development, we're also hopefully going to have um, Taylor, hopefully he's going to be available He's in the Bahamas, but we were hoping to have him come and sort of just be available and celebrate what he's done and what he's doing for Santa Cruz. It's amazing. And um, so I have invited him. I hope we can get him here via Zoom and just um, be able to thank him for really putting us on a, on the, on a global scale with what this, what's happening here. So it's, it's really, really cool. Right. You pinned down, but I did convey that, that invitation to him and the Pangea Sea crew. Great. Um, I'm Sonia, and then Sandy, and then Justin. Thank you, Kathy. I'm so excited and thrilled with this project. It's been wonderful to see um, the progress of all the walls around town. And I just wanted to share with everybody, I just picked that there is a map um, for, um, and I think you can also download it from the website. Um, that shows all the walls around the city of Santa Cruz and who the artists are. And so it's, um, it's out there. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to also say um, what an amazing project this is. Amazing thing to see it happening in our community. Um, 
And I, I see your point about going and checking it out, at, you know, watching people in action and seeing how fast this is happening um, with planning, of course, um, in advance, but it's just amazing. And the artists are, you know, who have brought their work to this are really, really amazing um, artists and members of our community and just the, the level of community um, kind of involvement and interest and appreciation for this is really, really um, one of the, you know, most wonderful things I've seen in a long time. And I'm, I'm so glad that you've been getting to work on this, uh, Kathy, with, with uh, the folks who are organizing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just, just to say, you know, it's, you know, uh, my dream is to have all of the big ugly walls in our community, sound walls, other walls, um, have, you know, the beautiful art and, um, you know, and intention and expression. And so this is just really great to see. And I hope we just get to keep on going. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Justin? Yeah, I won't take too much time to echo, but I think this is great. And it, w it would be good to, to know, um, you know, moving forward, what the city can do to help with the maintenance of these walls as time goes on and, you know, they start deteriorating because of weather and whatnot, you know, whether we can, how, how we can help support either the repainting of the murals or if there's something we can do every few years where a new concept is, comes up where we can, you know, paint something new on the, on the walls. But it'd be great to know how the city can help continue to support that effort moving forward. Um, and then I did have a question about the um, the Black Lives Matter mural downtown. I know that um, there's been a lot of discussion about you know just the painting of the the repainting of the mural, but then there's also kind of those spaces in between that are actually the you know street that also um, where the burnout also occurred. And so just wondering, or actually maybe it's just a comment that I don't I don't know how that they can take that into account. But if that's something the city also needs to weigh in on in terms of the areas outside of the mural where the individuals have burned out and the costs associated with that, because um, I don't know if that would be something that um, the city would want to recoup from uh, those individuals, or if that would be the muralist who would be including that in. So just thought I'd put that out there because I, I know that that would need to be cleaned up as well. That will, and that'll be part of the cost plan that will be presented to the court. It's believed that pressure washing will take off the marks, but will also take off the paint. And so really the the plan that would be presented to the court will be to repaint the whole mural, essentially very expensive. Um, Taylor Reinhold, who we just spoke about, is one of the um, muralists, and he did that on a volunteer for the Black Lives Matter effort, but there's no reason to expect him to redo it as a volunteer. So the original estimate, uh, cost estimates are uh, about $200,000 to when you count everything that was donated that came out of the committee for that effort. And that's what um, the public defender was trying to challenge, thinking you could just wash off the, the marks. And so that's the work ahead for the Equity Collab is to just fine tune in those costs and to really uh, come up with the idea of can it really be pressure washed or does there have to be a slurry seal on the street again? And there are communications with Rich Smith of Public Works about that. There's one thing about the uh, keeping the murals. Um, I will hazard that for many of those sites, the keeping the murals will be cheaper than getting the graffiti off the walls because that's current. Even you might have seen on one of the one of the walls, there already was a tag when it was nice and clean and white. And then also um, the Seawalls Festival has a history of being invited back to where they've been or sites where they've been before. This year, right before um, the, right before Seawall Santa Cruz, they were doing a second round in Boston. And so they do have a history of being invited back. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. Rosemary. Okay, great. I just wanted to share my screen briefly. This is a, uh, the public notice, uh, the notice of the public hearing that is happening on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Zoom meeting. It's, uh, this is a, a sort of a screenshot of the city's webpage on the transition to district election. Uh, the public hearing is a, um, it's not a uh, sort of a Brown Act related meeting, but it's really an opportunity to present information about what 
the process is and what the issues are. And so I, I wanted to make sure that's out there. And um, if people want to follow along as this process develops over many months, you can see there's additional uh, hearings that are required probably after the first of the year. Uh, this is the website to follow. So with that, I think we can move on in the agenda. Rosemary, I had just one question for the public, just so that they, I believe this meeting will be uh, their uh, translation yes. services, correct? Yes, there's a, a translation is planned and yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, next item is um, the council will review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda and revise it as necessary. I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. Um, there are no updates, but just a friendly reminder about the special meeting that's scheduled for this um, coming Tuesday, beginning at, um, it was originally at four, it's now 4.15. So we will have a special council meeting on, um, yeah, uh, excuse me, September 21st, starting at 4.15, um, and it will include both the presentation on um, from our water department, um, and this is where we have also put, um, remind me the second item, Bonnie. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, the, uh, the, right. oh, yeah, the oversized vehicle. We've also um, added a couple of consent items um, that need to be done sooner rather than later. Go on. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll now move on to our consent agenda. These are items 10 through 21 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 10 through 21. Instructions are on your screen. To mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you've been unmuted. All actions, actions will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any items on consent today? Okay, council member Cummings, council member Holder and council member Brown. Thank you, I'd like to pull item number 13. Okay. Council member Brown. Um, I'd like to pull item 17. Council member Folder, did you have- I just want to comment on 13. Just a comment, okay. okay. Great. Okay, so for our consent agenda, we have items 13 and 17 that have been pulled today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, so last call for any comments or questions on items that weren't pulled. And if not, um, I would like to open this up to public comment. So if there are any uh, members of the mayor. Oh, never mind. Disregard. Are we good? Yeah, I um, didn't have the second um, the second item, but I, I got it. 13 and 17. Okay. Uh, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our agenda with the exceptions of item 13 and 17, now is the time to do so. Please, raise, please press star nine on your phone and raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. We'll get our attendees. I'm not seeing any attendees in the audience with their hands up. So I will go ahead um, and bring this back to council. And we will go ahead and go for a vote on the remaining items. Again, um, this will just be for items, all the items on the agenda, uh, consent, uh, except for 13 and 17. So I'm now looking for a motion from uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, Martine? 
I'm happy to move the consent agenda with the exception of items 13 and 17. Okay. And Sandy? Is my hand still up? Oh, your hand was up. Sorry. Uh, oh, well, I can second it, but it looks okay. like others are ready to okay. do that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Councilmember Brown, and I uh, to approve the uh, consent agenda with the exception of items 13 and 17. And I'd like to ask the clerk to please take a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now come back to item number 13, which was pulled by Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I pulled this item because, um, well, just so the public is aware, item number 13 is the resolution related to adult personal use and personal possession entheogenic psychoactive plants and fungi. Um, this is something I spent a considerable amount of time working on with um, decriminalizing organic safety in the broader community. And um, I appreciate this because I know that there was some concern from um, the individuals within the group um, around one of the items that they included related to peyote and the inclusion of peyote in this um, item. Uh, I would just like to um, express the appreciation for the council members who brought this forward. I did have a couple questions um, related to um, rescinding the resolution. And then also um, I've been in touch with some of the members from the group who have um, expressed that um, given that I put a lot of work into this and worked with them and some of the concerns I had um, wanting to continue this item so that we can have um, a little bit of discussion over um, some of the engagement the members from the um, Native American church that have reached out to them. And so I uh, just wanted to bring that up. And um, when the time is appropriate, um, I'd be willing to make a motion to continue this item so that I could have a chance and other council members could have a chance to reach out to these individuals and have any questions and have concerns with. I'm not, I, I know that we need to go out to public for public comment, but um, I just wanted to bring that forward. And I spoke with the individuals from the group and they were, um, they agreed that if we needed more time, that they'd be happy to have a conversation since this isn't urgent. Can you clarify what group you're referring to? Normalized well, Nature, Santa Cruz, the individuals who brought this forward and who reached out to us to ask for the changes to be made. Uh, I have Councilmember Commentary Johnson and then Councilmember Watkins. Thank and I just you. want to be clear, we're um, quest to continue the item. I just want to see if we have response, um, and then I do. I will take it out to public comment. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councilmember Cummings, for your work on this in the past. Um, I was reached out by members of the community um, and ex there was an express uh, um, a request to move this forward urgently um, that the tribal community um, were really challenged with the way the resolution was adopted in the past um, and there was a sense of urgency to move this through pretty quickly and I have been engaging um, with members of the tribal communities through the whole country. Um, and um, Valerie Corral from WAM was um, the individual who was in contact with me and who connected me to other members of the community. Um, and there was a, definitely a sense of urgency of moving this forward. Um, they're aware that this was on the consent agenda. They've um, provided extensive feedback and we've taken that feedback into what you see before you in terms of the agenda, um, agenda item and the resolution. I was just I was just going to share um, what my colleague said in that we have been working really intimately with a lot of uh, community members who've been tracking this item and wanting to see these corrections made and feel comfortable with it as it is uh, presented today before you. Councilmember Boulder. 
So I'm happy to support the um, the item before, and I just um, have to comment that um, from a different perspective, the perspective of a parent and the perspective of an educator and um, part of super involved in the youth community in town, when this did become, come before the council, it was it was really opposed by a large majority of parent community. And I understand that there is legitimate um, uses for psychedelics, but with the overwhelming mental health and drug crisis we're experiencing here in Santa Cruz, it was really a disappointing move um, for a lot of parents in our community to see this on the council agenda and brought forward. Um, and I, w I don't support continuing it. I think we need to move forward with, with this at this time. And Councilman Brown. I'll just say I appreciate my colleagues work on this and the intention here and I am not in any way suggesting that I oppose moving in this direction, um, but I also support continuing the item. Um, remind my colleagues that um, from time to time when I bring items similar to this where I've been working with community groups, uh, um, I've been told, well, we didn't hear anything about it and we need to learn more. And this is a case where that is true for me. Um, we no um, outreach to the council at least came to me about this. Um, I've kind of done some of my own research. I've had conversations. I think the question around uh, cultural resources and conservation that are raised are very critical. And um, you know, and I, I do want to uh, make uh, amendments that really um, address those concerns. But I think it's fair to ask for a continuation for, you know, I mean, until our next meeting at least so we can have some of those conversations with folks in our community. It is not a, a, a given that um, some of the changes that um, are, are listed in the, in the proposal we have before us, um, you know, are, are agreed upon. I mean, there's, you know, there, and I don't want to go into the details of that, but I think it is, um, you know, I would, I would ask for the same um, consideration that um, given others um, when the same requests have been made of me. Okay, um, is there a uh, motion? Uh... You didn't do public comment yet. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go out to public comment. I, I did have one question that didn't get answered earlier. Okay, go ahead. So I was asking the city, I wanted to get the, get some input from the city attorney because it um, looks like part of the resolution is to rescind this original resolution. I was just curious um, if that's kind of the standard practice or if um, in general it makes sense just to amend the language of the resolution since the bulk of the resolution isn't changing. Um, it's just language within it. So I wasn't sure if you could maybe Bonnie. provide some input on that. Bonnie, yeah. Comment. Hang on, Tony. Bonnie, yeah, I can, uh, Tony can answer, but that's also an internal city clerk process. But if Tony wants to start, and then if I have anything to add. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. Essentially, we we um, we could do a resolution amending the existing resolution. However, um, in doing so, in order for a member of the public to be fully informed about the matter, they would then need to review both the original resolution and the resolution amending it. So we thought it would be a, um, a better approach to merely uh, readopt uh, with these minor changes. Um, it doesn't change the effect of the prior resolution at all. It just uh, means that this resolution will be um, you know, the one that is in effect uh, going forward. Bonnie, did you have any questions or comments to add? No, not really. It did, um, for further information, it that for historical purposes, it is better to rescind for the exact reason that the city attorney mentioned that somebody 20 years from now, looking back, would have to then find the other one that it was amended. So it's just cleaner to rescind it and make sure all the information is included in the new one as well. Thank you, Bonnie. 
Okay, I would look for uh, the council member Watkins and then council Mer member Colin Tar Johnson. Um, I don't know, Mayor, if you wanted to go out to, to public comment. Oh, I'm but sorry, I'm, I'm going to go out to public comment. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and I see Pat. Pat Mallow's out there. Hi, Pat. Go ahead, please. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great. I'll just have to check. Well, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for hearing this. Um, you know, and <clears throat> it's just for a bit of back context. Uh, soon after um, our original resolution passed, uh, we became, got put in touch through Valley Corral with uh, folks from the Native Church and the ICPP group. Um, and they just were concerned with uh, something that had happened in Oakland with this peyote, um, you know, language being included, even though they had had discussions with um, the Oakland groups not to include that language. Um, it was sort of on our radar and a group that when, when we were originally working towards this, but somewhere in the back and forth between drafts, uh, we reverted back to the Oakland language, which included this reference to peyote. Uh, the Native Church had us, uh, was interested in us, you know, doing a kind of a clarification statement or apology, um, and we did that. But because this all happened when COVID and, you know, other complications were really gearing up, it was, it was something that we, you know, reached out to folks on the council initially, but there's just other stuff going on. Um, and then a little while ago, Val reached out, um, uh, council person Johnson was, who responded to that and we went forward and from, you know, the native church perspective, it's something that, you know, just they want to get done so that it doesn't become a model that others follow and that it doesn't encourage folks going out there and uh, poaching basically the historic peyote gardens that, um, you know, are in danger from all sorts of reasons, but um, but this need to be another one of those reasons. So um, long story short is that this is just a bit of like housekeeping kind of, and uh, I don't think it changes the on the ground effect or the historical significance of our thing. It just, uh, you know, provides some context to reflect what we're doing. So uh, we're happy if it happens today or next week, or at least your next meeting from my perspective. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. I don't see any other hands up for this item. So I'll go ahead and bring it back to council for a motion. Council Member Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'm happy to move the item. Um, uh, I think that I want to one thing, Councilmember Talentor Johnson for her work. I know that she did put in the extra time and effort to really have those um, conversations with key folks. And um, I think that, again, as most things, we can always come back to um, further refine in the future. But um, for the purposes of where we're at today and making this correction, I feel comfortable moving the item. I just also want to echo um, Councilmember Golder's comments in regards to really just holistically thinking about how are we addressing uh, mental health issues, how are we protecting our youth, how are we thinking about brain development, and how are we also including some of these alternatives and, and recognizing some of their healing properties as well. So it's sort of a both, a both and, right? Um, but uh, with those comments, I'm happy to move the recommendation. Councilmember Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you. I was going to make the same motion, but I'll second. Um, and I just want to um, thank Pat for calling in and for all the work that he did on it. Um, I think this is this is the right move to make it to um, respectful of the request that was made from us. And um, and I understand there was a lot of work that went into it before, and um, a lot of work that's gone into it in the last few months. So thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Watkins, uh, seconded by Councilmember Johnson, and I will go ahead and ask for the clerk to uh, call the roll call. call I, have I have questions and potential friendly amendments. So. Um, the question procedure was yeah. over. Well, I, well, then I'd like to make some friendly amendments to this item and see if the, my colleagues will be. And I know that under turn it back to Council Member Watkins as the maker of the motion to see if these amendments are amenable. Um, 
I, I feel comfortable with the motion as is. I think that um, if they're minor, I guess we could look at that, but we've had this vetted by our key folks that have really spoken to us by the community and our city attorney look at it. So I don't want to stray too far from what I think where we are and how we got here. Um, so if they're not, um, I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly where, where you want to take this at Councilman Cummings, but I, I feel good where we were and where we are because we already kind of did a lot of the legwork essentially to have some of the key folks have eyes on it. And I, you know, one of the we'll move on to a, and I'll just Council respond. Member Walker, um, or my understanding is do you want to, are you interested in any friendly amendments or are you ready to move on? Well, I personally feel like this one is a pretty good, a pretty good, um, it's at a pretty good place because of the work that had gone into it, particularly with the being um, some of the key key members of the community who wanted to have eyes on this, have that completely vetted and then brought forward. So I feel like, you know, I don't want to go too far down a route around um, trying to change the wording too much because of the work that we kind of had our community members do at this point. So if it's anything um, kind of way off base, then I, I don't think I'd feel comfortable with that at this time. So, Bonnie, did you have a comment on that? And, I'm sorry, and, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, for the minute, maybe I missed it, but was the friendly amendment made? No, not yet. Okay. No. I'm just I'm trying to get clarifications. I, I heard Council Member Watkins state that she was satisfied with the motion. So I'm happy to have those put up if you want to consider them, the maker of the motion wants to consider them. Do we have those friendly amendments, or do you want to look I'd at like them? I mean, make the motion. So, I'm happy to take a look at them, and, and I'll ask the seconder as well. But uh, like I said, I think if it kind of goes too far off, I feel like we've really landed in a good place because of where we have our community input. But Member Cummings, if you want to put the friendly amendments up, I'm wondering if um, because I, you know, my hope was that we could have at least allowed a little bit more time given the amount of work um, that I've put into this with the community. Um, my hope was that we could continue this, but since we're not going to and seeing the direction we're going in, I would just like to offer um, um, amendments to some of the language that's in here because um, as, a, as a biologist and as someone who um, spent some time on this, I think that we need to be explicit and there's a couple times within this resolution where we're not in terms of what we're saying is going to be criminalized versus what will not be criminalized. So what I've heard from um, the members of the community who brought this is that the emphasis is on peyote. And so I'm wondering if we could get the red line language of this put on the screen Um, yeah, give me a second. I had to go online. Mayor, um, I don't know. I'll, I'll look to the seconder of the motion and my colleagues, but again, I think when we're starting to change the language and not having it go through some of the key folks that we had it go through, I don't think I'm going to be comfortable with changing the language on the dais at this time. If this wants to be brought that brought back at a future time after having that process go forward, um, I think I'd feel more comfortable with that. But given the work that we did and the vetting that we did, I can already kind of feel my discomfort with trying to change this language without kind of going through some of the community members that we spoke with. And I'll look to the seconder of the motion for she has been the person who's been the primary contact with those folks. I was going to uh, make the same comments, Councilmember Cummings. If um, you want to, let's let's pass this as is, and if you want to work together and bring it back in a different iteration, and we connect back with the tribal leaders and community members, I'd be happy to do that. Well, then I guess the question for me is, it sounds like continuing this and then allowing for, because since this has been brought forward already by three council members, if we vote to continue, we can work together and we can shorten that process. We can engage with the and the people who've been working on this and bring back the language and it's minor it's very minor amendments so that's really you know the the interest in trying to, to continue is that we will reduce that amount of time rather than having it go come back again for a full reading we can continue it make the minor adjustments and 
we can bring it forward. So if what I'm asking for is exactly what you're expressing, is that if we want to work on this, like I would like to work on this a little bit, get more community input, we could do that together. And so that's the reason and the basis for asking for a continuance of this item. And again, I think we all agree that we'd like to move forward with it at this time. And then if there are future iterations that are going to be forthcoming, those can be you know, brought forward then. But in, um, in the interest of the work that's been accomplished and the timeliness of wanting to see this through, I think it's sort of, it, it's, um, it's either path. And since there's a motion to already move it forward, I, I feel comfortable moving forward with it at this, this time. We have a motion on Motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Contari Johnson. This is on uh, item number 13 on our agenda, which is the resolution declaring the investigation and arrest of individuals 21 years of age and older involved with adult personal use and personal possession of ethnogenic psychoactive plants and fungi listed on the federal Schedule one list be amongst the lowest priorities for the city of Santa Cruz and rescinding resolution number 29. Um, comma 623. Uh, and Bonnie, I'll go ahead and get a report on that. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Um, aye. A, I'm Coming. disappointed to not have the same consideration um, and I'll, um, it's not that I oppose this, I'm, I'm just disappointed, but I. Cummings? I'm going to vote aye, but I'll also express and be expecting to hold my colleagues and, you know, accountable for this and we'll be looking forward to working with the community so we're back to make the, the, the necessary adjustments. Um, I'm also disappointed that we couldn't work together productively especially given the amount of work it took to bring this forward in the first place um, for over a year working with the community. Uh, it just seems like, you know, a week or two of additional work would have been appreciated. So I'll be supporting this, but I will also be bringing um, items to the attention of members of the community who help work on this. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go on to item number 17 that was pulled from the council from the consent agenda. And this was by I believe Council Member Brown. Uh, that's correct. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I pulled this item, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, it, it I was hoping to to move through items like this on consent, but um, given past experience and recent experience um, with kind of side, you know, questions and recommendations, learning more after the fact, I've decided that I'm gonna make this official. Um, so for folks who are listening, this is uh, a proposal to for a contract uh, with Kimley Horn and Associates to work on uh, traffic improvements in on the front street uh, side of the downtown uh, due um, to uh, a lot of new development happening there. Um, and that's to improve, uh, as I understand it, as I read the item, um, you know, to make improvements that will help with traffic flow, safety um, for all kinds of transportation users, so bikes, pedestrians, um, and, and vehicles. And I don't see um, any indication that there is um, any consultation happening with the Transportation and Public Works Commission on this. I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that we have commissions for. Um, I'm I currently on the RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission. This is exactly the kind of thing we would ask our bike um, advisory, bicycle advisory committee to um, be involved in. They have a particular, you know, they are, are nominated and, and put on that um, commission because they have a particular interest and some expertise, and they are really ready to get into the weeds on uh, des intersection design and pedestrian and bicycle safety. And I think they should have an, some official role. And so 
I'd like to know, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear, from, I see um, staff is here, and so I'd like to hear uh, your thinking on that. Um, is the Transportation and Public Works Commission um, involved in the, um, you know, the overall um, TIP program for, based upon, you know, the downtown uh, plan modifications that have been made? Like, what, what role are they playing and um, have they played and what role do you anticipate um, for them? Sure, I'll go this one, David. Uh, hi, Nathan here. Uh, Data Santa Cruz Transportation Manager. Um, so this project, uh, regards to what we're asking for today, is to do ask New Horn to do some additional analysis on the Front Street uh, corridor as part of the downtown uh, amendments plan. To find the downtown area, we need to accommodate uh, the appropriate transportation along that corridor. And so uh, there was an initial concept plan that was provided during one of the development uh, projects that was submitted, I uh, believe it might have been the 100 Laurel Street project. Um, we took a look at that and uh, we liked that initial concept plan. And so the staff report before you today is to, to expand upon that concept. And uh, the process will be to absolutely take it back to the uh, TPWC at a later date once those concept plans are, are, are a little further along. Um, I did mention to uh, uh, the chair, uh, Phil, that we would be bringing this back Front Street uh, uh, corridor project to, to the t uh, commission for review and uh, uh, foundation for approval. But this contract is only to bring up the, uh, the concept plan to a 30% level. And so there will be some uh, uh, room for or dates later in the future, but we will be deliberating this in, in a public forum about the about the concepts, about the concept itself, and then um, uh, there will be a little time to provide input at that time. Nathan, I, I would also just point out, um, if you look at the attachments, the attachments to the concept plan, the uh, final bullet in task three is to present the concept plan at up to four public hearings, including the uh, Transportation and Public Works Commission and Downtown Commission. So it is uh, worked into the scope of work with this contract. And that, that would be for a, a, to get feedback on a completed plan. Progress towards a completed plan. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion, but I know we need to go to the public if, if other council members don't have any questions. I might, uh, one, one more thing I might add uh, during that process, just to make it clear that we're not uh, designing in a vacuum, is that Matt also has a very important um, perspective and needs uh, that will need to be worked into any feedback we get from a, a city deliberative body. Uh, Mayor, I think you're muted. I have a barking dog problem here. Um, I'm gonna bring this out to public comment. This is item number 17, which is the Downtown Intersections Improvements Award Contract to Kimley Horn and Associates. This has been pulled for discussion. If you're interested in um, making a comment on this item, please press star nine to raise your hand and we will unmute you and look for your comment. And I am not seeing it in the audience, so I'll go ahead and bring this back to council for a motion and council member Brown. I go ahead and move the staff recommendation and include with that direction that the that staff bring this item to the transportation and public works public works commission um, at its the earliest possible date and to work with the chair of the transportation and public works commission to determine when that um, ha it happens, when that will happen. And council member Cummings? Second. Okay. Is that direction clear in the motion? Yes. I'll try, I tried to capture that, I'm sure Bonnie did too. Um, okay, we have a motion on, a motion by uh, council member Brown, seconded by council member Cummings to move the staff recommendation um, with the with direction to bring this back 
Transportation and Public Works Commission and to work with the chair of the Transportation and Public Works Commission um, to schedule that to schedule that meeting. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I think my language included at the earliest at the possible. earliest time. Convenience. Okay. That's, that's what I got. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins, did you have a question? Just kind of clarifying question to see if the staff wanted to, if that is like feasible in terms of the whole plan and where that kind of lands in terms of the process, if they wanted to speak to that. Well, as I mentioned, the scope of work already includes that. Um, this is just being explicit that we will indeed uh, work with the Transportation and Public Works or Public Works and Transportation Commission. Yeah, it was anticipated that we would take it back to TGWC and possibly even have additional uh, public hearings with regards to this, to this plan. And so it was built into the scope. So thanks for the reminder about that, David. Um, and so we will all work with, uh, you know, Phil to tell the chair to, to schedule that at our earliest meeting. Okay, so just the timing. That'd be great. Thank you. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have item number two, 22, which is a public hearing for the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-17, amending chapter 13.40 of the municipal code related to the Parks and Recreation Department's program. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Are there any council members or uh, are there any council members who have questions or comments on this item? Not seeing any. Okay. Um, for members of the public who are interested in commenting on the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-17 amending chapter 13.40 of the municipal code related to the Parks and Recreation Department's adopt a park program, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I am not seeing any hands in the audience for the public comment. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council and I'll look for a motion. Uh, Martine Watkins and then Justin Cummings. I'm just happy to move the um, recommendation and the second reading and final adoption of the ordinance number 2021-17 amending the chapter 13.40 of the municipal code related to the Parks and Recreation Department's adopt a park program. Thank you. Council Member Cummings? Second. We have a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Cummings, and I'd like to ask Burke to please take a roll call vote. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Matt. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to our general business um, item. And um, if possible, I'd like to take just about a 15 minute break just to use the restroom and stretch our legs. And we will reconvene at, um, just make it at 2.30. And we'll be starting our general business items, which will be um, SEIU, of understanding and the contract for the mixed use library, not your architect. We'll just take a brief, brief break. Thank you.
Okay, we will go ahead and get started again. <clears throat> Next up on our agenda is item number 23, Temporary SEIU Local 521 Employee Association Memorandum of Understanding. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the city council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Okay, I will go ahead and turn this over to Lisa Murphy, our human resources director. Council member, the item before you is the tentative agreement with the SPIU Local 521 Temporary Employees Unit. This tentative agreement is a one-year agreement the terms of the agreement is a three and a half percent COLA. And in addition, it is a new salary schedule for the last three. This is again, a tentative agreement. It's been ratified by the uh, union and the action for, before you today is to approve the tentative agreement. And then at a future date, I will bring back to you the actual MOU as we need to revise that item as well. And that, is the conclusion of my uh, presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Is there questions from council members on this? I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I'll go ahead and take it out the public comment. If you are interested in commenting on temporary on item number 23, which is the temporary SEIU Local 521 Employee Association Memorandum of Understanding, Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be then set to two minutes. I'm not seeing any raised hands in the meeting attendees today, so I will bring it back to council and I would look for a motion. Vice Mayor Bruner and then Councilmember Cummings. Oh, you're muted, Vice Mayor. I'm happy to move the resolution adopting a tentative agreement with the temporary SEIU Local 521 Employee Association. Thank you. Council Member Cummings? Second. Did you have a comment or question, Sandy? Council Member Brown? I do have a quick comment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, yeah, I'm going to support the motion because this is an agreement that the um, union uh, members have um, agreed to. I want to make a statement about this, I, uh, or two statements. One, I'm glad to see that we are able to address the some of my concerns about um, livable wages. Uh, at least making some improvement with respect to the lifeguards. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I also want to just say, though, that um, the cost of living adjustment included in this contract um, at 3.5% does not even meet this year's consumer price index increase uh, for the San Francisco area. And so this means that we have uh, a con, you know, we're, we're going to be signing off on a contract where. Um, workers are falling even further behind. And um, and just encourage my colleagues to think about that uh, for future contract negotiations and um, hopefully other discussions that we'll have about um, how we uh, address uh, the living wage policies on our books with respect to our own workforce uh, moving forward. So uh, I'll, um, I just wanted to make it clear that this is not a generous contract, um, and um, we we have a lot of work to do. But I will support the motion today. Thank you. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Bruner, seconded by Council Member Cummings, to um, adopt the tentative agreement, the temporary SEIU Local 521 Employee Association. And Bonnie, could we get a roll call vote? Council Members Watkins? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Silver? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. 
that motion passes unanimously. Okay, we'll now move on to our next item, which is item number 24, contract for the mixed use library master, library master architect. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to Bonnie Lipscomb, our Director of Economic Development, for a uh, for her staff presentation, and then we'll we'll take comments or excuse me, take questions from City Council. Welcome, Bonnie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good to to be here this afternoon and presenting this item. This has definitely been a, a few months process and we are so delighted with the outcome and I'm looking forward to sharing with you today just sort of the overview of the process again. We highlighted it a little earlier in our quarterly update, but now we're, we're going into a little more detail on the Master Library Architect. And with me today, presenting shortly, is Abe Jason with Jason Architect Architecture and Katie Stewart also with Jason Architecture. So I'll be kicking off to talk a little bit about the contract and the process, and then I'll turn it over to Abe and Katie to present about um, their process, community engagement, and how they approach projects. So really looking forward to their part of the presentation. And with that, I will share my screen. Get started. So the agenda is really to start off by looking at the background and process for the request for proposals and the recommended selection before you today. Dig a little into the contract scope and timeline, um, talk about the community outreach process, touch on the funding sources, the recommendation, and then the presentation by Jason. And then we're gonna wrap it up um, with some comments and perspective from our interim uh, library director. Eric Howard, and then um, just go over next steps and then take any questions that you have. So first, background and process. Um, I did show this earlier today, but I know not everyone was, was tuned into the quarterly update. Um, the process for the request for proposals, which was released um, in April, we had five, nine firms um, who submitted proposals, and of those nine firms, um, we um, look specifically at the project team, past-related experience, design and program, approach to scope. Um, four teams of those nine were interviewed, Dreyfus and Blackford, uh, Jason Architecture, ABA, and Group 4. And of those teams, we, after the first interview, we had two teams do a second interview. And following the second round of interviews, Architecture was the unanimous um, sort of selection by our whole panel um, as a preferred master library architect. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna mention it again. We are just so excited to have Jason um, on this project. It's, it's so huge for our community, for our downtown, um, to have a new state-of-the-art library um, in our community. It's been a long time in coming, and Jason Architecture is the right firm to do this for us. You all are familiar with some of his work. Um, you're gonna see more of that in his presentation. Um, but as overall, uh, you know, Jason and, and, uh, and Abe and, J and Katie, their approach to scope, the quality and success of their community engagement that, you know, many of you have participated in some of their outreach sessions. Of course, our library subcommittee has firsthand um, participated in a year-long process of community engagement around the existing library site. So you're very familiar with their work. Um, they have a wide breadth of experience and local projects and really just top-notch design. So, really excited that they are our team, um, really working with us directly. And we'll also be doing and leading our community engagement efforts really for the whole process in this initial part, because a lot of the look and feel of what people are gonna feel on the street really is the library, the public library, how it engages with the pedestrians, how it engages as a user, a library patron, how it engages if you're a business across the street, if you're a visitor to the downtown, that look and feel is really going to be felt by that presence of the library. So they are just really a key component of this project. So just to go a little bit into the contract scope and timeline, I just wanted to just highlight kind of the role of the master library. Um, they will serve um, as the lead architect of the downtown library in integration with the overall site design. As I said, the library is really going to be what you're going to see 
as the main sort of element and component of this project. Yes, you'll see the housing, but most likely it will be articulated and sit and, and set back. It's the library that's going to interface with you at that ground level, and it's going to be pretty tall as well on that ground level for the library for that engagement. So that's a key piece of it. Um, Jason will lead the community engagement efforts on library site design and integration, as I mentioned, with the overall site design. Um, they're going to prepare three key sort of site concepts for council consideration. That will come back to you in December. Um, some of the phases that they'll be doing is this initial sort of kickoff conceptual design, which will then move into after you make a decision on the overall site um, pieces and uh, mixed uses and how those that looks like. Um, we'll move into schematic design and ultimately design development draw, um, drawings. And each of these early phases um, will have active community engagement. And then finally, for sort of the second phase of the project, they'll prepare construction documents, assistance during bidding, and construction administration is further outlined in the contract. So the total cost for scope for completion is 2.29 million as outlined in the contract, which is attached to the staff report. An important thing to note is that the contract does allow the city to terminate the contract for convenience with 10 days notice. So if at any point in this process, there is a project stop or we need to we need to take a pause or regroup, we will not be obligated for the 2.29 million if the project is terminated at any time. We'll only be obligated to pay for the work completed to date and it is billed on a monthly basis. So there won't be a position where we are obligated and we'll be spending more money if the project's not going forward. And I just really felt it was important to, to mention that um, just because um, it, it's key to getting quality architects to, to be able to advertise and have a full scope of a project. That's really important. But um, Jason's been willing to work with us in understanding the complexity of this project, um, all the mixed pieces, and the fact that they're willing to um, work with us on the contract and understand the community context is really important. So we're really appreciative um, of their willingness to do that. Um, in the contract, we have estimates for each phase. That's in one of the exhibits to the contract. You can look at that a little more closely. It includes the timing for outlines in the contract. Pre-design, which is really our conceptual design, is estimated to start um, right, after, right after this meeting, if this is approved today, and it'll conclude in early December. And we'll have outreach and community workshops. All of those will be noticed and posted on the city's project website. And that's at cityofsantacruz.com slash mixed use library. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, staff will report on December for feedback and direction on conceptual project design. Now, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about community outreach um, because this is a really important part of the project and one of the elements that we are so excited to have Jason on board. And so in the early part of the process, and this was a bit of a change from what's in the contract, and this is just based on back and forth having an initial discussion with the project team about how important it was to have community engagement in early. We actually moved um, the six focus groups, stakeholder focus groups from the schematic design and just moved them up to the conceptual design. So I'm gonna change the contract um, after this meeting. There are a few other um, things in the contract, just uh, edits um, typically after, after council approval that we'll make as well. Um, but this is one that I wanted to highlight is that in conceptual design, I mean, this is really looking at stakeholder focus groups, um, and we have a lot of those in the community, particularly on this project. Um, and Abe and Katie will go a little more into kind of who, who we're thinking of at this point that are really in those stakeholder focus groups. Um, we'll have this really engaged process where core themes um, for the overall project, for the program, for the look and feel will be, um, feedback will be incorporated, and then we'll really take that back and Abe and Katie will take that back to the drawing board as far as how that really translates into the look and feel of the library and how it interacts with the public. And then during schematic design, there'll be two workshops as well. And, you know, this will be a variety of small group breakout sessions. You know, we'll have those both in each phase of the project. And then we'll also have presentations to council. We'll have conceptual design um, to really help the design team focus on one preferred design, and then we'll be able to go into the detail schematic design, um, more in-depth cost estimates and analysis, and be able to really work forward from there. Um, funding sources. Um, this is highlighted in the, in the fiscal impact section, but I did want to take just a minute to talk about this. 
Um, funding for the contract for the current fiscal year is budgeted in the approved um, fiscal year capital improvement project budget, and it includes the following sources breakdown, Measure F Fund, um, Economic Development Trust Fund, and the Parking District. Um, this is the master library architect, so a good portion of this will be funded with Measure S funds, but we will be contributing these two other sources as appropriate. And basically, we're looking a holistic, we're looking at that this is a mixed use project. So where there's some design overlap with the other elements of the project, we'll make sure that we're assigning that appropriately from a cost perspective to our other funding sources. Um, so the recommendation, um, our recommendation, staff recommendation is to award the contract to the mixed use library uh, master architect to Jason Architecture in an amount not, uh, in an amount up to 2.29 million and authorize the city manager, the interim city manager to execute an agreement with Jason Architecture in a form to be approved by the city attorney. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Abe Jason. I'm going to stop screen sharing and Abe is going to, thanks Abe. Welcome Abe, hi Katie, good to see you both. Very excited to hear from you today. Thank you Bonnie and uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, we're thrilled to be here today. Um, this is a really exciting moment in what has been uh, sort of an incredible community process that has been built through years and, and uh, really, you know, almost decades in the community of Santa Cruz. So we're incredibly excited to be here. Um, I wanna just briefly take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, I actually wanna to speak to kind of how kind of honored I am personally to kind of be a part of this process. We have been working with the Santa Cruz Public Library since 2017 uh, in the county on the recently on the Beach Branch and the currently under construction Boulder Creek and Live Oak branches. And uh, we're also incredibly excited to be working on the now under construction Garfield Park branch and Branch of 40 branch within the city. Um, it is just a real honor to be able to continue this journey with your community. So I'm incredibly excited to be here today. I'll let uh, Katie introduce herself. Thanks, babe. Hello everyone, I'm Katie Stewart, uh, project manager at Jason Architecture. I'm also project manager for a number of your branch libraries. Um, and just like Abe, I really feel like it's a privilege to get to work with um, with Santa Cruz, with Santa Cruz Public Libraries and the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, and we're really excited to be um, a part of this this project that, um, that the city has been working so hard for. So, th so today we're gonna to talk about kind of three specific things about the project. The first is expertise. And we're gonna talk about architectural expertise on libraries through a lens of understanding the components that really make a wonderful library. We're gonna show you some of our work, but we're gonna speak less about the kind of each individual project and more about what, what components of those projects make for good libraries. Uh, we're gonna talk about engagement and uh, you know, sort of community is you know one of the reasons that love doing libraries and we're gonna be uh, kind of uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively with the community to promote dialogue and achieve great feedback for this project. And then last, we're gonna talk about values and this is kind of the values that we uh, you know, have as architects and uh, designers of community buildings and then the values that the city of Santa Cruz and the community of Santa Cruz have and share and how those values come together to craft a narrative that reflects the, the city of Santa Cruz and the community. So first we're gonna uh, talk about expertise. And like I said, uh, I wanna talk about this through the lens of uh, different components that make a successful library. The first component is placemaking. And so uh, this is the Campbell Library. And what you can see is, you know, really working to a sense of a building settling into its place a comfortable approach, kind of a kind of understanding of its relationship to the surroundings, graceful materials. So placemaking is a critical component of buildings. Daylight is super important for a public building, especially true for a library, which is a bigger public facility that tends to have sort of a, a wide floor area and often in the middle of the building, if not designed properly, can be dark. So we look very carefully at how we sort of make sure the entire daylight, day, daylight interiors feels welcoming and comfortable, good to sit down and read a book without the lights on. We think about scale. 
uh, for the Half Moon Bay Library, thinking about how a building steps down to a residential community that's immediately adjacent, and how a civic building is a friendly neighbor, how you mass a building, how the components of the exterior of the building sort of break down uh, to create smaller pieces that feel, feel very comfortable from a pedestrian level. And we think about materiality, uh, again, at the Half Moon Bay Library, uh, kind of, you know, it's just a richness of character, of texture. We have uh, patinaed, weathered copper, core 10 steel with a rusted ex exterior on it, weathered wood that kind of has an appearance of driftwood. So we really think about the richness of materiality and how uh, kind of people relate to buildings and how that gives kind of meaning to buildings. And I'm gonna hand it over to Katie, and she's actually gonna talk a little bit about uh, our work with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries and some components of those projects. Thanks, babe. Uh, making sure I wasn't on mute, <laughs> classic. Um, so you might recognize this building, it's the Garfield Park Library renovation. Um, and the focus on this space is kind of a small space, so we're focused on creating these special moments within the space. Um, you can see here we've carved out kind of this little reading that sort of inhabits the bookshelves. And we see this as a way to make a really fun memory for the kids as they experience the space. Um, another sort of focus of the Garfield Park Library is its, uh, its value as a historic structure. Um, it's a Carnegie Library from the beginning of the 20th century. And so in this uh, renovation, we really wanted to honor that history. Um, and that's applicable for all of our buildings because we really want to honor the historic context of a library even as it moves into the modern era. This next building is your Branch of Forty Branch Library. Um, and looking at this, um, this is the children's area, kind of looking at this space, it's um, the main focus is how do we break a large room down into distinct programmatic zones. Um, so within this children's area, we have a that's sort of um, along the back wall there for the older kids. Um, we have kind of a middle zone, which is the younger kids, the picture books area. And then we have this really fun, playful furniture zone um, where kids can run and maybe be a little bit more active along the right-hand side of the page here. Also at Branson 40, we're really focused on creating a new space for people to gather. Um, we're introducing a whole new community room into this um, community rooms um, tend to be a really important program area for modern libraries. It's one of the sort of big features that a community looks for is a space where they can come and hold events, um, not just during uh, sort of typical library hours, but also after hours. Um, so it's something that we absolutely want to focus on for the new space is thinking about how this can provide a service to your community um, beyond maybe the traditional role of a library. Then moving on to Boulder Creek, another one of your Branch libraries, this one's a little bit more far flung up in the Redwoods. Here we're really thinking about different ways that people use the library to, to read, so creating diverse seating areas. Um, we have kind of a more comfortable lounge seating area that's right by a fireplace for kind of quiet reading. Um, we have a more studious tape, sort of typical reading table layout, either out desktop computers. And then we have kind of a casual laptop bar where you could pull up um, with your laptop and get a little bit of work done, um, either with yourself or with a small group. And then Boulder Creek also includes a really beautiful children's area. Um, we really wanted this space to capture imagination. Um, the Boulder Creek Library, like I just said, it's located in the Redwoods, and so we really envisioned this space as kind of a, a tree house in the trees that's gonna be really evoc evocative and again, capture people's imagination. And then we have the Live Oak Library. Um, and this space is really about crafting areas for families to be together, um, whether it's, you know, checking out books, using the computers, you know, doing a puppet little kids, or, you know, maybe doing homework with older kids. Um, this is a space where families can come and read and learn um, and enjoy their time in the library together. And then also in Live Oak, we really like to focus on um, kind of portals within the library, moving from one space to another, how does that experience change? Um, so in the Live Oak Library, as you enter into the children's area, you through this kind of kelp portal, um, which will really transport you to another world. Um, it's kind of a riff on this idea of imagination that I talked with with the Boulder Creek Library. And then we have the La Selva Beach Library, your most recently completed branch library. Um, and here you can see our value of really creating a wel welcoming arrival 
for a library patron, where they get to walk in the door, immediately be greeted, have a really clear understanding of how to use the space, where they need to go, um, and feel kind of that excitement about walking into a, a new space. And then um, just a really lovely image of the La Salva Beach Library that really exhibits the warmth that this building has. Um, it feels welcoming, it feels comforting, it feels like a place you can really come and sort of relax and be at home. So every good design process for a community building starts with engagement. We uh, sort of have a really uh, sort of robust group of expertise, and that's true on the project team side, but I want to also emphasize how important and true that is on the community side, that there's an immense amount of expertise within the community and the community stakeholders group. And one of the first things we look to do at the outset of a community engagement process is to connect these groups and, and connect and use synergy to kind of share that expertise and bring the project up collectively. So we have kind of just an immense uh, resource that we look forward to tapping into right at the outset of this project. We also start every project uh, with uh, kind of a certain amount of humbleness. Uh, it's important that we come in and we start the process by learning. Uh, we are uh, experts in designing libraries, but we are not experts in your community. So one of the first things we do is listen to the true experts in your community, which is you, the community. And we have an, we have an immense amount of learning to do at the outset of this project, learning about the cultural context and kind of what makes Santa Cruz special, uh, you know, what contributes to kind of uh, the success in the downtown, what are the greater cultural uh, values of Santa Cruz. We also need to learn about the natural context and uh, how that should influence the aesthetic of the building, how that influences uh, the way spaces are used, what in transitions. Uh, it also has to do with uh, designing a building of uh, high level of sustainability because we start with principles of passive sustainability rather than active sustainability, which means we're, we will learn about the elements and work with them uh, so that it, the energy use is minimized before we ever think about things like solar panels and other things like that. Of course, part of this process is a process of communication and presenting design ideas. So we uh, sort of use effective presentation tools where we, we think of architecture actually is a process of communication more than anything. Uh, we as architects don't build buildings, we communicate what buildings are. And, and so part of that process is presenting our ideas in, in graphic formats. And we do, do that by engaging the community with compelling imagery. So imagery that really uh, allows uh, the community to step inside the building and understand what it's going to feel like and kind of answer some of their questions about what is this building going to be. Now it's really important, you know, as a part of uh, the process, we don't just present, we don't just engage, we listen. So this kind of speaks back to learning about your community. Listening is one of the most important skills uh, for an architectural team. And we work hard to be active and uh, sort of really careful listeners. And in this process, one of the things that we're going to be doing is, uh, you know, many times, you know, community presentation structured where, you know, questions for the community, you know, the community has questions for the architectural team at the end. We actually often go into these community meetings with questions that we have for the community. So again, this kind of comes back to our, our kind of uh, knowledge that the community are, are experts in themselves, and often uh, sort of getting answered about a successful building means reaching out to the community and asking uh, kind of specific things that will help the design team advance the design in a positive way. And so here's some examples of that from the Garfield Park Library. So what does that mean in terms of process outcomes? We have a couple really important outcomes that we strive for. The first is fostering group dialogue. Uh, this is a communication process. It's a process of uh, kind of meeting with neighbors and meeting with the different stakeholder groups and understanding um, what are very complex uh, sort of uh, goals for a project and how they all come together to make it greater than the sum of its parts. And that speaks to promoting stakeholder teamwork. We, we uh, set that as a goal early in the community process that there's teamwork between the different stakeholders. 
During that process, we're doing a lot of listening. And one of the things we're listening for is, is because part of a, a, what a library is, is something that tells the story of your community. So we'll be listening for those narratives that really reflect Santa Cruz. And then lastly, it's important that we develop community ownership. So that means that you know we work with uh, the community through this process so they see the project develop, they see their input and their feedback incorporated with each round of the community process, and they, they really actually develop an incredible sense of ownership over the design because they were a part of that process and they contributed to it. So I wanna end by talking about values because it's really important for architecture, particularly public architecture and civic architecture to be grounded in values. One of the values that we hold very dear, and we know this is important to the, the city of Santa Cruz is sustainability. And we are thrilled that the library is targeting zero net energy. And uh, that is something we will uh, kind of be working on early in the process. And that speaks back to kind of learning about nature and thinking about passive design strategies. And then as well as working with a really talented uh, technical team of experts about how we achieve a kind of a very ambitious goal. Community is just a critical value for a library. Libraries actually uh, are one of the preeminent community centers in America these days. And there's different ways to serve communities. It can be through a story time event in a children's area. It can be through a maker space where uh, the teams are kind of showing off their technology skills or it could be for an outdoor gathering. Santa Cruz has beautiful weather and uh, you know, we'd love the opportunity to utilize some, kind of, some of those warm uh, you know, evenings uh, to, for outdoor events. And it's also important that we have civic pride in these buildings and these buildings reflect the values and the importance that they represent for the community. A library is an important building for uh, any community and certainly for the community of Santa Cruz. And we design with that in mind that they have a prominence that, that respects and honors that civic pride. But it's not all about the big moments. It's not all about the on the street. It's also about the little moments. And we work very hard in our designs. And we value this very much to create special moments that really are moments of kind of inspiration and wonder uh, for when people walk into these buildings. Libraries are more than just a building. They are community spaces, they're spaces of creativity, they're spaces of learning. And this is an example of this portal to the children's area at the Half Moon Bay Library, where you can see some of these early sketches of the idea of undersea bubbles becoming the children's sign and how that becomes a reality. And these special moments, they contribute to the memories of the community. The you know, children are gonna come to this library they're gonna read their first book there, they're gonna check out their first book there, they're gonna meet, meet friends, they're gonna spend time with family, they're gonna grow the community. Years later, they're gonna have memories about this early experience they had at the Santa Cruz Library, and we are so excited to help create those memories with you. Thank you. Thank you, Abe and Katie, really appreciate that. We need to see all your work um, all over. So thank you. Wadi, do you have a wrap up? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go over actually to our interim library director, Eric Howard, who'd like to share a few comments. And then I'm going to wrap up with next steps after Eric. Great, thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Council members. Welcome, Abe and Katie. Um, one of the things that I really respect and admire in Abe and Katie is, is their humility and their willingness to learn and listen. Um, I've worked with quite a few architectural firms before, uh, and the three key things that I always look for is, is how responsive they are, um, their experience, and how innovative they are. And they knock it out of the park in all three of those categories. As, as, as you heard, um, we're, this is not, um, it, an independent library as part of a larger system. Um, and they have, even though he's, even though they are really humble, they have uh, an amazing amount of experience in how he works um, and its culture. Um, as they pointed out, um, our most northern uh, branch is in, is in Boulder Creek and they're working on that now. 
um, in completing that project. And our most southern um, branch is La Selva, and they completed a beautiful uh, remodel there. Um, not to mention Live Oak, um, Brant of Forty, uh, and, and Garfield. Um, another important piece of that experience is working with uh, my staff. Um, they have a really great understanding of how we work internally. They're really responsive to not just my needs, but to all the needs of the staff. Uh, in, in addition to the funders um, that we rely on too to enhance these buildings, um, while we rely um, on, on Measure S to make these really beautiful buildings, we rely on private donations um, to enhance these buildings, every single one of them. Um, and Abe and Katie have been really responsive to their needs as well. Um, when we've had donor meetings um, and they've given tours of these branches, um, I can't say enough um, uh, how, how important that relationship is as well. So I, I just, just want to thank them for, for, for their presentation today and for, for giving me the time to, to, to speak and provide a few words. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I'm going to share just one last, or actually last two slides. Um, which is on next steps. And so just to wrap this up, um, to approve the contract today is for us to um, meet uh, as a whole group and with the design uh, with the design team and plan out um, sort of the timing um, and the stakeholder meetings. We're going to have October stakeholder um, meetings that we um, are hoping to, to kick off as well as workshops um, in November and December. And then we would be scheduled to um, come back to December, um, and I highlighted this a little bit earlier as well, for a council presentation on major site design concepts. Um, and then meanwhile, we'll continue um, working with the farmer's market um, as brought up in our earlier presentation. Um, we also have um, you know, other stakeholders, um, including Total Fitness, that we'll be working with as well. Um, on the site and including in those stakeholder meetings, we'll be working with downtown organizations, downtown groups, um, as well as you know, members of the community and interest groups. So we'll, they'll all be part of the outreach process and all of that will be presented and posted and noticed on our website. Um, so with that, um, that concludes um, the presentation and um, we are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bonnie. And again, thank you to Abe and um, Katie, and good to see you, Eric. Um, we, we will go ahead and take uh, questions from the council at this time. Um, I do also just wanna make an announcement for our next item, item number 25, because I do know that some folks will be um, joining for that. And uh, I know four o'clock was sort of a time that had been put out there. I just wanna announce, um, we are not, and we, we will not be taking public comment this evening. That item has, uh, it is recommended to be continued to October 12th, 2021. Um, I just wanna make sure that that is available for people to consider. Uh, we will, the, the item will be um, heard, but um, we aren't anticipating having public comment this evening on that due to the continuation. Um, so I'll flip back down to this though real quick and um, go ahead and take uh, questions from council. I see council member Cummings, council member Golder, and then council member Colin Tar Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that presentation on this item. Good to see you and um, Katie. Uh, I had a question, I don't know who, um, this should be directed to. But last year, we had some extensive work done by group four to kind of come up with the design for the library mixed use project on this site and put on different types of designs. And the council recommended um, one of the designs in the end that would have parking detached and try to maximize the amount of housing units and so now with moving forward um, with Jason Architect, I'm just wondering, because of the fact that there was a lot of community input and there was a lot of work done and, and money spent on that group, how do we, or what's the plan for incorporating the designs that were brought for us from that group with kind of, um, you know, moving ahead, so. I'll start. Um uh, Council 
Councilmember Cummings, and then, um, you know, Abe, you may want to add on to that. But I will say that we took um, the site design and the specifics from the community outreach and the work that Group 4 did. And that was included as part of the scope for the request for proposals for all the architect teams. So all of them, when they presented their proposals, they presented it on the basic design that was the recommended design of Group 4 that council approved that was based on the community outreach. With that said, um, you know, each of the architect teams, you know, did, did look at the possibilities for the site, and there are some other options to consider as well that could result in potentially some more affordability, um, greater unit count, um, and just some flexibility in the project. So we've encouraged them to make sure, particularly in the initial phase that, you know, pre-design, um, conceptual, that we are designing towards that direction that we had from council. Um, but we didn't want to close off the possibility that there could be a configuration on the site that actually nets us more affordable housing and potentially nets us um, greater space for the library by creating some efficiencies um, from the integration of the project in a different way. And so um, we're, we're going to be looking at that closely, and, um, but we're very aware of the community input to date and um, want to make sure that that's being carried through. Since this has been you know, a multi-year process, there has, have been many touch points with the community over the years. And of course, the extensive work done with Jason in the past as well is also information on the project that we're carrying forward as far as the values and the, and the input on the project to date. And so with that, AP may have some additional context to add. Thank you, Bonnie. So I, I don't have uh, too much to add to that. I think Bonnie it described it well, but it, it, essentially that's, that's correct, that, that our scope is uh, basically defined by the you know previous iterations of community process that led up to this point, and we will use that as a start for our process. Um, and we're, we'll be working directly with the city and the community to sort of further shape it to be the most successful project. Great. That, those are all the comments I had. I just um, was hearing some concern around, you know, are we starting again from, you know, step one with the, with the library and just wanted to make sure that that was clear to the community that um, that, that previous designs from group four are being taken into account as we move forward. So. Thank you for that clarification. Council member Boulder. I didn't have any questions. I just had comments and I just think that the designs that you shared were so beautiful and it was so inspirational and I can't wait to see this project complete. And I think it's going to be such a tremendous asset to our community. So thank you for all your work. I really appreciate it. Council member Colantara Johnson. Thank you. Yes, I would like to echo those sentiments. Beautiful job on the um, other libraries throughout the community. And thank you to the whole team for the presentation. I had a couple of questions about the community engagement process. It sounds like a pretty thorough process. Um, my assumption is that I wanted to the notices of the workshops and focus groups will also be noticed and conducted in Spanish. Is that correct assumption? Yeah, we've been doing that on a lot, almost all of our recent outreach. So that's that's our plan is to continue that. Great, thank you. And and um, how have we done outreach to the Latinx community in the city? What's our approach? Or what will be our approach? I haven't spearheaded that, but I I, I have been engaged just in, in getting you know up up to speed on on some of that. We've been working um, with the city's liaison um, as it has been part of the, the process and, and the approach. And then we've been working also with some of our community partners um, that uh, and sort of sharing the notices with them and making sure that they have communication. Great. Um, and then my last question is, I imagine that some of the efforts you've done here and elsewhere, the community engagement has been online given the current situation we're still in. Um, could you, um, either Abe or Katie, um, touch on how you have made these uh, online engagements accessible and um, interactive to community members? So I, I will um, actually acknowledge that we haven't done a project from the outset uh, online, although we have done community engagement online. So this will be the first one where 
theoretically, we, we, we may have kind of a multi-event series uh, in mind. On some level, I don't think the, the kind of approach changes dramatically. It, it, it sort of speaks to we, we build the process up from the beginning. Um, so we're, we're not entering this process and then presenting a design to the community. That's not, that's not how we approach this. We engage the community uh, in, a, in kind of listening and kind of information gathering first. And then we actually kind of take them along on the process of kind of learning about how we kind of think and structure kind of uh, design development. But similarly, it will be uh, kind of structured regardless of whether it was online or in person. We will uh, generally at the workshops lead with a brief presentation and then we'll do breakout groups. So uh, Zoom has the ability, ability to break out into rooms. So that we kind of try and break down the scale and people have a little bit more ability to dialogue with each other. And uh, but we kind of work with the community so that there's notes taken in that small breakout group. And then that small breakout group then can report back to the larger community. So there's kind of that idea of small group dialogue is present whether it's, it's online or in person. And uh, we will obviously adapt like everyone to kind of COVID protocols as we go forward. Thank you. And maybe just a, a thought or question for, um, I know that in the past when we've had um, community engagement efforts, we have, I believe we've opened up the library for those who don't have um, internet access or the capability to access these things on their own. So maybe that's something we can think about as part of this process. Thank and, you um, so much. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I was just going to point out that as of today, we opened up um, reservations for our program and conference room. So we just into the swing of that at all of our branches that are open right now. Um, and then also just that, to try to answer your earlier question, we do have, we do outreach all the time, um, but beyond just, to, you know, not just to the city. So it's because this is everybody's library throughout the county. So, so we'll be doing outreach um, in Spanish and in English um, um, throughout the county to, to, to get feedback on this. Great, thank you so much. I'm also really excited about it. Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Abe and Katie, for the presentation. It's good to see you. It's good to see your beautiful work. Um, and I just I wanted to ask a couple of questions um, about your how you're thinking about um, described really really clearly and um, you know vividly how you think about the experience and um, placemaking and um, showed us some beautiful buildings. And I just wanted to, so I have two questions. One is related to um, your role now being as the architect for a component of a mixed use project um, where the mass of the building and the height and all of that are, are gonna be dependent on, you know, broader set of, um, of goals. And so I'm just wondering how you think about, um, you know, that street level engaging, you know, how, how people feel about the space of the library, given that it's the um, most likely on the first floor of uh, a much larger building. So just trying to think about like in those images, you see the sky and um, it feels open and that's not going to be the case um, if, with, in this case. So just how you're thinking about that. And then um, I think that there are uh, a lot of variables and, you know, things that are gonna depend upon, you know, other other pieces coming into place. Um, what square footage you have in mind at the moment? Are you are you thinking about uh, the that additional 5,000 square feet? I know as a member of the library subcommittee or the mixed use, or the library subcommittee, excuse me, um, that, you know, we talked about that being a really big incentive for doing a project in this way is that we were going to get uh, significant more square footage for additional program space and other spaces. So um, are you operating on uh, the additional 5,000 square feet uh, assumption or are you trying to just figure out how to factor that in as, you, as we go along? Sure. So, uh Thank you, uh, Councilmember Brown. Nice to see you again. Um, 
So first on the issue of the square footage, uh, I'm very familiar with the kind of the different uh, sort of calculations of square footage and the different studies that have been done over the years. Uh, what I'll say is we, we defer to the city um, in terms of setting kind of the programmatic targets. Um, uh, we're kind of familiar with the different categories and we're going to work with the city about kind of where their goals are at. Uh, and obviously that'll be where, you know, sort of a conversation done in tandem with the library as well. Uh, so I, I can't say specifically that we have decided to design to a specific target today. Uh, but what I can say is that we'll, we'll work uh, with the city and the library and uh, sort of build from that programmatic basis. Um, in regard to kind of the, the library as a part of uh, kind of this mixed use project. Uh, I think it's a really exciting opportunity and it's actually a programmatic pairing that is becoming more and more common, uh, both with libraries and just kind of in general throughout America that uh, these uh, kind of libraries are being developed in tandem with uh, affordable housing in many cases and in larger mixed use projects. There's a multitude of reasons for that. There's, there's kind of synergistic reasons in terms of uh, kind of the, the way different uses kind of reinforce each other, uh, the idea that children who live in the building could go to the library. And there's also uh, kind of reasons from a funding standpoint that they're being developed together. There's often an economy of scale of bringing the bigger project. Uh, in terms of design, so that's the other piece of it, is kind of how does it, how does it feel comfortable in terms of the way uh, we think of it is that the library and the housing are going to be friendly neighbors. So they're not the same building per se, even though they, they technically, from a building code standpoint, it is the same building. But when we think about design, we'll think about kind of careful differentiation of the library from the housing in the way that they're, they're having a friendly conversation with each other. So they're not, the, they're not trying to be the same. They're not trying to dress in the same clothes. Uh, repeat each other like a parent, but they, they're in dialogue in a way that they feel comfortable next to each other. So obviously we haven't designed the building yet, but going in, I, I can say at the outset that, that that's how we'll be thinking about it, is that the, the library will be in dialogue with the affordable housing and vice versa, and they will sort of, at, at the kind of areas where the buildings kind of interact with each other, will think very carefully about those kind of moments of interaction um, so that they, they feel kind of carefully tailored um, and kind of give the building a sense of scale and friendliness. So I, I hopefully that kind of answers your question about kind of how it will be integrated. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, Council Member Brown, about the size of the building. As part of the scope, uh, we're really looking at maximizing the footprint for the library and recognizing that there is a cost associated with that. So part of the direction and the exercise that we'll be doing and looking at the various pieces and programmatically the elements and the direction that we had previously from council is how to most efficiently and from a design perspective successfully achieve that. So when we come back to you, you know, in, in early December, um, we're really hoping to be able to show you, you know, a design maximizes. Hopefully they get to that higher square footage for the library because we know that's a goal for everyone. And if we can do that, you know, cost effectively as well, and we think that there may be a way to do that, you know, all the better. So those are our goals. That's what we're striving to achieve. Thank you. I see Vice Mayor Bruner, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abe and Katie. Um, my questions, I, I I also had questions on the outreach and engagement on the different components of the library in your presentation. Um, there were great library examples. And so in the timeline that is included in the packet, um, I don't want to assume, but uh, with uh, the engagement, uh, how the housing parts being library all fits in, is that all at once? or do you break it down throughout the timeline? What does that process look like? I, I can speak uh, briefly and then Bonnie, you may wanna add as well, but the, I, would, I would see the development kind of happening concurrently uh, to kind of uh, Council Member Brown's question. Uh, the design of the library and the affordable housing, they do need to be thought of together. So uh, this is not this is not two projects in isolation. These are uh, programmatic uses that need to speak to each other and build off each other. 
uh, we would definitely see that kind of moving forward together. And we know that you, you can't have a community process for uh, this project without talking about both components. It will be difficult to separate them out. So yes, I, I would see them moving forward together. Bonnie, maybe you can add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, uh, that's right. I mean, when we come back to you, we're not just going to be presenting the library. It's going to be the whole project. And we're going to have uh, at least one option that's you know, really close, almost exactly close, the concept design where we had the council direction from last June based on group four's work. And then taking those same programmatic elements and looking at ways we might be able to net more affordable units and more library. If there are other creative options to create that in the project, we're gonna see that as well. But it's gonna be for the entire project. Um, we're really focused and and, and visually um, having, you know, Jason Texture be the lead as the master library architect. They're still really engaged overall in the look and feel of the entire project. And that's really why we have that forefront is also because it really is the library that is going to be visually what you're experiencing when you when you come to the project, particularly on the pedestrian level. And so um, we wanna make sure that that's really leading the design we move forward on this project. But the design elements on the housing, that's key too. And because we have such a great team and they're gonna be working together, we know that we're going to have a project that meets all of our goals as far as sort of just the overall look and feel and how it's integrated into the surrounding block and the neighbors. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. I'm not seeing any other hands up right now, so I'll go ahead and take this out to the um, public now. And um, I see we have one attendee with their hand up. So this is for um, item number 24 on our agenda today. That's the contract for the mixed use library master architect. So if you will press star nine on your, or excuse me, if you press star six on your phone, we'll unmute you and you can go ahead and speak. This is for phone number ending in 5362. Go ahead. Star six, one more time. Go ahead, for phone number ending in 5362, go ahead and, yeah, there you go, you're ready to go. Okay, thanks. Hi everybody, it's Judy Grenstra. I had uh, thought of um, just presenting some other thoughts, but now I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, the council might not be aware that the library is embarking on a strategic process in the coming months. Doesn't it seem premature to have Jason design the interior spaces of the library before the strategic plan? An analysis of how much space for each of the library services and programs would best serve this community was done by consultant Penny Hummel during the Nolan Tam process about four years ago. Now that was for a 44,000 square foot building, significantly larger than what we'd be able to afford. In short, wouldn't it make more sense to design a building after the library has gone through the strategic planning process? Okay, now I'm switching to my latest um, reaction to what I've just heard here. So are you saying that the um, Abe, uh, Jason, which I, I you know, greatly am, uh, admire Abe, Jason, and Katie as a team, um, now are we, the, my concern was about the outreach. Now that um, Bonnie has uh, noted that the order of the uh, meetings is different with the uh, pre-design meetings now consisting of uh, six focus groups and three workshops, which was originally scheduled for later. So are these two, uh, is all this outreach, three workshops and six focus groups all supposed to happen in the week after Thanksgiving? Because that is really, inconvenient timing as far as the um, ability of the public to participate because it's right around Thanksgiving and it's just too uh, condensed. Okay, that was one point. Um, the other one is, are you saying that this, this outreach conducted by Jason is going to include uh, design of the housing components? Because I was under the impression it was just gonna be about the library. Because if you're including housing, it's gonna be way too much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Next up, I have Krista. 
Thank you, council members. Um, so this will be a this will be this should be a pretty straightforward question, but I was looking for the answer. So um, the uh, I, I, an acquaintance of mine pointed this out that in the RFP for the downtown library mixed use project, um, the project proposal must include a minimum of 50 affordable houses above a new ground level downtown library. Um, and then and then she also pointed out that the motion um, for approving this project was specifically for a minimum of 50 low income housing units. So I know that affordable and low income have you know different meanings um, and that those mean you know need to be you know they, they have like very specific parameters. So I want to I want to ask it, is it 50 low income housing units that are going into this? Plant or is it 50 affordable housing units? Thank you. We will try to clarify that um, as needed with the uh, staff. Uh, or excuse me, other comments from the public today on item number 24? Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak to this item. You can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. Okay, I'm not seeing any other uh, folks in the um, in the meeting today that would like to speak to this item. So I'll go ahead and bring it back to to the council um, for deliberation and action. Vice Mayor Bruner, I see you, and Member Boulder, and then Council Member Watkins. Thank you. Um, I know we received some information earlier. I wanted to just quickly ask Bonnie Lipscomb to clarify um, that there would be uh, 107 um, housing units of extremely low and very low on uh, the housing portion of this development. Is that correct? That's right. So it is affordable housing, but the categories of affordability for this particular project are very low. Um, so at 50% or lower of area median income, or even extremely low at 30% of area median income. So we're targeting those um, because that's the uh, hardest to build um, affordable housing in our community and the least likely housing to be built. Um, without a without a public subsidy, so even affordable housing developers frequently, you know, are, have some have some challenge getting at that low unless there's a significant public investment. So um, we're really focusing there, and it will also help us meet our regional regional housing needs allocation, our arena goals. Great. Um, I'm happy to make a motion uh, to move and towards awarding the contract for the mixed use library master architect to Jason Architecture in an amount up to 2.289550 or 2.9 and off 2.29 and authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Jason Architecture in a form to be approved by the city attorney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Is there a second to that? Uh, Council Member Golder, I saw you. Okay. This is seconded by Council Member Golder. We have a motion on the floor then to um, go with the staff recommendation. And is there additional comments from council members um, regarding? Go ahead, Council Member Brown. I'll just be very quick. Thank you. I, um, you know, I find myself in a, a difficult position here because I, I absolutely support. Um, the Jason Architecture being our um, our architect for and to do the design for our new downtown library. I'm thrilled about the uh, potential to get very low and extremely low income units actually built in our community. And I also am, um, you know, I, I have heard so much concern uh, among community members about this particular site and the massing um, on this site. And, you know, and I just feel like supporting the things that I really want to support. Um, I can't, I can't do that because I'm not going to be able to support them. And, um, 
speak just right now it feels like there you know there's just given the contentiousness of this issue and you know ultimately my concerns about the siting and the um you know community response um i i can't support the you know the mixed use project moving forward on this site so um I, i'll be voting no on the motion but i i do just want to say that um I, you know i really have a lot of respect for um, you know, Abe and Katie, your work, and I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with, and I'm glad you're excited, and I'm glad others are excited, um, but I, I can't support it today um, for the, the bigger context. Thank you, council member. Hey, I'm not seeing any other hands up by my colleagues, so um, we'll go ahead and uh, call for a roll call vote. We have a motion made by Vice Mayor Bruner, seconded by Council Member Golder, to award the contract for the mixed use library master architect to Jason Architecture. And Bonnie, can we do a roll call vote, please? Council Members Watkins. Hi, and I wanna say thank you for the presentation. Helen Tori Johnson. Aye. Brown. No. Cummings? Hi, and I'll just say for the record as well that um, I really wanted to see how this continues to roll out, especially given that there's a lot of potential for affordable housing. And I know we need to really balance all of the needs of the community. And I think that um, we have the potential in this project to really meet the needs of various stakeholder groups. And so, well, I'll be happy with the outcome. I think we're gonna get a lot of positive community benefits. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes. And we had uh, six in favor and one, one against. Thank you, everyone. And congratulations, Abe and Katie. We look forward to uh, working with you a lot over the coming coming months. So welcome back. Thank you, and uh, we're so excited to. to uh, <laughs> it's a privilege to work with you. We're very very excited. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm clearly excited enough to knock my uh, headphones out. So yeah, whatever Katie said. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Okay, we will move on to item number 25 now. And item number 25 is 831 Water Street. And the purpose of this item was to conduct a public oversight meeting as according to SB 35, to assess compliance with objective standards criteria and accompanying density bonus requests for an affordable housing project proposed pursuant to SB 35. I just wanna be clear for today, for the public attending today's uh, meeting, this item is recommended for continuation to October 12th, 2021. This continuation is recommended to allow for our staff to complete further review of the revised plan submitted by the applicant on September 9th, 2021. Our staff has done, our staff to date has done an outstanding job on the review of this project to date and this new information needs the same level of review. The October 12, 2021 meeting will include a public comment period. And at this time today, we will not be taking public comment today due to this continuation of this item. And I would look for a motion to continue this item to October 12, 2021 from one of my colleagues. And I do see uh, council member Golder's uh, hand up. So um, I will move the recommendation to continue item 25, E31 Water Street to September 12th, 2021 um, for the public oversight meeting. Actually, October, wait, what did I say? <laughs> I said, yeah, October 12th. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And I will second that um, motion and um, we can go ahead. Um, I don't know, uh, my understanding is um, we are, I'm looking for Mr. Condotti here a little bit. So we have a motion on the floor. Uh, Tony, deliberation by council is, um, I believe, to, to not be held today either, correct? 
That's right. The only issue before you is the continuance. The council members can comment on the on the continuance of the item, but substantive comments on the project or that sort of thing would be appropriate when the item is actually um, uh, presented to you uh, substantively. We have a motion with a second. Um, so we're getting guidance from our attorney that uh, comments on the continuance are appropriate. Um, other items, other comments should be held to the actual um, notice uh, meeting in October, October 12th. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I will just add a few quick comments. Um, again, letting our community know that um, this is a very complex project. It's a very complex law. Both of these are complex laws. And we, um, I just want to again, recognize our staff. Um, I think they've done a lot of work to try to really understand um, and look at the, um, the objective standards that we do have on the books with respect to this, um, to this project. So we look forward to uh, receiving additional analysis by the staff um, for this. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, appreciate the staff's analysis on the July 27th application for this project, and I fully support the initial staff recommendation for denial based on the analysis due to the project's numerous inconsistencies with the city's objective standards. The applicant has, re has legally agreed to an extension of the time period for consideration of his application to October 14th and has provided a letter which was circulated to the council to express this in writing. So I just wanna make sure that members of the public know that this has been legally documented. And while my preference would be to deny the application based on the staff's analysis and require the applicant to submit a new application, I understand that under SB 35, a developer has the right to revise an application and the agreement to the extension gives the city a reasonable amount of time to analyze the September 9th application. Uh, given the decision has been made to not hold public comment, I'm prepared to, um, I was prepared to make a motion um, that has some amendments. So I sent it to Bonnie and um, would like to see if either we could vote on the motion with the amendments um, or if we could um, vote on them separately. But the motion would be to um, move the staff's recommendation based on the applicant's agreement to continue the 831 Water Street project October 12, 2021 with the additional actions. One, the city council indicates its intention and support of the previous staff recommendation to have denied the July 27th application based on the detailed staff analysis of its inconsistencies with the requirement of SB 35 to direct staff to provide as early as possible before the October 12th consideration of September 9th application and analysis of it as detailed as the one that was provided for the July 27th application. And three, that since it's prohibited from conducting secret review for this under SB 35, the city shall not act as a responsible entity for the purposes of conducting environmental review of Section 8 voucher applications for SB 35 projects. Um, Tony, uh, Councilmember Cummings, I don't believe we are accepting another motion this point afternoon. of order. I, I'm sorry. I have to. I I'm got I'm to just ask. I'm gonna look um, for a. I, I'm just getting clarification from our attorney. I, yes, so that's what I'd like. I to have. Do. I have that's the. All I'm gonna do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna present anything. <laughs> it wasn't clear to me whether this was intended to be a substitute motion or a. Uh, or uh, yeah, that a that was my question as well. A request for a friendly amendment. I would say, however, that I believe that it would in be inappropriate for the council to take action on item number three. Um, first of all, because I, I think in order to make a policy determination about how the city council would handle section eight vouchers for a, an SB 35 project in general, um, that's a policy issue that's not before the council. Uh, second of all, um, I think you would have to have public comment for that. Uh, and thirdly, my understanding is that uh, projects that require NEPA review, um, the, the responsible agency uh, for that is the, is the agency in whose jurisdiction the project is located. So I think from a legal perspective, that's probably problematic as well. Um, as to items one and two, I think, um, I, I guess I would just ask for, if this was intended as a friendly amendment or a substitute.
substitute motion. I'm just not clear on that. Well, it sounds like that the friendly amendment wasn't going to be accepted, so I'm happy to move it as a substitute motion. So we'll take a vote on the substitute motion. Then, Tony, is the substitute motion <coughs> have a second? Second. And can I just ask for clarification? Does the substitute motion also include item three? I would ask that item three be included uh, for consideration on October 12th. If we can't make those changes today, then you know, as these, as these applications are coming forward, we need to understand what role the city has. And since we can't discuss it or make any action on it today, then I think that it would be good so that the public understands, you know, what role we can play and we can have a determination of, of that when it comes to these NEPA um, reviews. I, I think I, what I would suggest um, if the council wants to consider these items is that we we proceed with a vote on the, the motion to substitute um, council member Cummings motion for the prior motion um, and just take an up or down vote on that. And then the council could debate the content of the motion if it passes. So we have a substitute motion on the floor. So now under your, you need to vote whether or not to accept the substitute exactly. motion. And, but I want to make sure I'm understanding what the substitute motion is. Does it include number three? Because I don't understand, I didn't get, that wasn't a clear answer for that specific question. And, and what I would recommend is that we clarify that if the substitute motion okay. is accepted. Okay, so we have a substitute motion on the floor uh, by council member Cummings, seconded by council member Brown. And this would be to accept the substitute motion and Correct. get a roll call vote. Um, Councilmember Watkins, did you have a question or comment? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I just wanted to get a question because I'm in terms of process, Tony. What I heard you say is that um, it's really about the continuance of the discussion, just to continue the item. Um, right. But going into sort of substantive. Uh, statements as sort of listed, I, that feels sort of um, not necessarily process, but I, I just am a little concerned also given our, our earlier conversation in closed session. Yeah, I, sh I mean, I share those concerns, um, and, and it, which is kind of why I'm suggesting that the council move forward sort of forthwith and decide whether or not to accept the substitute motion. Okay. So we'll go ahead and have a roll call vote, please, Bonnie. Council Member Watkins? No, and for the record, it's just because of the legal considerations um, associated. Calentari Johnson? No, and I have the same concern. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? No, and I have the same concern. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner? No. And Mayor Myers? Uh, I'm no also, and I have the same concern. Specifically, um, the language in the motion is um, inaccurate and um, it, uh, just based on our understand my understanding about speak 35. Okay, that substitute motion fails. Uh, so we will go ahead and take a roll call vote on the um, motion to continue. Council member Watkins. Aye. Helen Terry Johnson. Aye. Brown. Cummings. No, and I just want to make sure it's clear for members of the public that um, I'm very much in support of um, the recommendations to deny this project um, based on the detailed staff analysis that came before the city council and that came before the community before it got changed uh, yesterday at the end of the day. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner. 
Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes with five for the motion and two against the motion. Okay, we are currently for with item number 25 and I did go out of order. I'm gonna go ahead and move to oral communications now. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly, slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture, capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to state your name. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to log with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. You see that we have two uh, folks in the audience regarding oral communications. I have phone number ending in 1810. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, how about blame shifting of his failed policies? Let's skip the previous judgmental errors of the lockdowns, arbitrary essential workers and businesses, the silly science of cloth masks, and the many other ill-conceived mandates causing mass casualty, economic health, and social chaos damage. I focus here on the continuous 100% policy bet on mRNA vaccines falsely promising a zero utopia and what has become an unfathomable monumental blunder using COVID fear porn at best. At worst, it is pure paid for politics, big pharma greed, Gates greed, authoritarian political power grabbing, Fauci lies, and now mostly a Biden administration doing a blame shifting to cover up his many continuous and multifaceted policy failures by doubling down over and over with ever big moral lies, a gag on free speech, censoring truth by big tech media, and an unwarranted assault on American freedom never before seen in this country, pitting neighbor against neighbor, fomenting civil war. It's go time against Biden and the like, not your neighbor if you ever want to be a free people again. As to the policy error, it's plainly wrong to force every single person to undergo uh, medical procedures with 100% uh, 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 informed consent. Uh, uh, for a disease with such low mortality rate for so many people while denying treatment and deprioritizing treatment research. Worse, the long-term risks are still unknown and available data suggests the vaccines aren't as effective, safe, or long-lasting as they need to be. The latest paper out of UC Davis finds 12 to 17-year-old vaccinated boys are over six times to develop a cardiac adverse event heart problem compared to unvaccinated children who required COVID hospitalization. Another finds COVID immunity for the recovered is 13 to 20 times more effective than mRNA vaccine immunity. Thank Forcing you. something indiscriminately Thank inside you. others' bodies is Thank a you. Race. Your time is up. Next up, I have a phone number ending in 3585. If you could press star six to unmute yourself, please. You press star six, you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Yes, my question is, will there be local hiring requirements on these projects for all the libraries so that taxpayer money stays within the community? Thank you, sir. Next up we have item, or excuse me, phone number, uh, Ending in 5362. Go ahead. Hi again, it's Judy Grunstra. I'm following up on a discussion at a recent meeting about the fate of the River Street sign. Informal polling on Santa Cruz locals showed a majority of people in favor of not reinstalling that sign, which is currently out of sight, thank goodness. I believe Justin said uh, council might discuss the sign with the public works staff. Please scrap the design, uh, scrap the sign, recycle the materials, and get the Arts Commission and public involved in a design process for a welcoming, attractive sign, or just install some landscaping or trees. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Krista. 
Please press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just wanted to say that support um, high density housing, bringing high density housing to Santa Cruz, especially low income and extremely low income. I think that's really important. And I think a lot of council members agree. Um, I could support it much more and more vocally if uh, if I was confident that our, you know, we had a plan for our water supply. A lot of the conversations I'm having um, with folks around this issue is is mostly just really concerned about. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know much about planning for long-term water supply, but I bet our interim city manager does, and I bet there are a lot of uh, members in the community who have really good ideas about this. Um, I know, you know, Cal, there's you know a lot of history with with that, and I don't know if that's the right direction or not, but I would really like to see some, you know, really proactive action to concerns uh, around water, especially when we're bringing, you know, developments. And um, I mean, I think housing housing is, is, is wonderful. It's hard, it's kind of hard to support hotels when I'm con considering water, the water shortage, because, you know, visitors come in, they, you know, they're welcome to use as much water as they'd like. And um, so I, I, I wouldn't support that, but I would like to see some uh, strong aggressive action on uh, protecting our water. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands up for oral communications this afternoon. Um, and with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone.